This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Welcome to Amherst Planning Board meeting of February 17th, 2021, based on Governor Baker's executive order of suspending certain provisions of, open, of the open meeting law, GL chapter 30A, section 20, and signed Thursday, March, March 12th, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jemsek, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.35 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken as normal. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Here. Tom Long. Tom is not here. Andrew McDougall. Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Present. All right, and myself. Uh, board members, if technical difficulties arise, you may need to pause temporarily to correct the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do not have technical issues, please let, if you do have technical issues, please let Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical, technical issues are addressed and the meet minutes will note if this occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment item and other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. The link is shown on the slide and can be entered into a search engine. The link is also listed on the meeting agenda posted on the town website via the calendar listing for this meeting. Or you can go to the planning board web page and click the most recent agenda, which will list the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate uh, if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called upon, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. And uh, we can get on to the agenda here. And I don't believe we have minutes is that correct that is correct jack i finished up a set at about five o'clock but i didn't think anybody would have a chance to read them so next time that's fine um i think you know we're, we're kind of caught up so that's basically um, or, or 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 do we have any that that are outstanding more than like a month or two months um, I am not exactly sure because I've been so busy with other things this past week, but um, I think I we look... have one from July 1st and I oh, take okay. responsibility for that. I'm All sorry right. about that. Okay. Well, we'll get that one done. All righty. So uh, we can uh, initiate the public comment period and I, I uh, actually have to see here. I have to get that view up. Sorry, participants. All right, there is one hand I see up in the attendees. I see Susanna and I will allow her to speak. Okay. Hi, Susanna, I've allowed you to speak. Can you unmute yourself? I have done so. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Susanna Muspratt, 38 North Prospect Street in Amherst. And I would just like to commend both the zoning subcommittee and the planning board for the excellent analyses on footnote B and footnote M that you've done in the past couple of weeks. Um, as somebody who's still trying to get up to speed on zoning, I particularly appreciate the, the visuals, the uh, drawings 
and the chart that kind of distill down what the findings have been. And I think uh, many other people in town will be interested in those. We heard a few weeks ago that the planning board was going to put up a website somewhere on the town website about tracking the progress on these various zoning studies and uh, where there could be these images and maybe some hot links and even a place for people to register their comments. And I hope at some point in this meeting, someone will update us on where that project stands. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you, Susanna. And I don't see any other hands. Chris, do you want to speak to that in terms of um, uh, yeah, I, I'm Chris Brester, Planning Director. We have had conversations with the CRC about this, and they are doing outreach, and um, they are planning to put up a website about the zoning amendments, and we need to coordinate with them. So our intention is to put something up on the Planning Board webpage, but we just haven't figured out exactly what that should be given the fact that CRC is also doing the same thing. So, um, but I think that now that we have we have three um, PowerPoint presentations that we could probably put up on the website and um, try to create some kind of comment space for people. And uh, maybe Pam could speak to that a little bit because she's more of a, of a website guru than I am. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of waiting for some real solid concrete direction of how CRC's webpage is going to complement what we're doing in the planning department um, and the planning board. However, currently, all the documents um, that are included in the planning board packets, as well as additional presentations, are posted. And you can find them by going to the planning board page on the website. And looking down, when you're looking at the computer, it's down to the right-hand side. You'll see a little spot that says PB Packets. And everything in there is up to date, including tonight, except for I had difficulty right before the meeting um, posting the updated presentation that Maureen Pollock has done about footnote M. Um, so we're going to work on that, and I promise it'll be up there tomorrow in the morning. Check. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we have Ira. <clears throat> Ira Brick. Yes. Hello, Ira. Hi, how are you? Very well. How are good. you? Good, too. Thank you. So I'm Ira Brick from 255 Strong Street. I'm not going to surprise you with anything I have to say. Um, except to say that when you're trying out a big idea like Obamacare, it's good to look to where it has worked. For instance, Romney Care in Massachusetts. Before McDonald's tries anything new of Mc pancakes or McLobster, they try it in their secret test kitchen in Chicago. And I would just suggest if the planning board and the town council are dead set on making some changes, make them in a village center. Not that the village centers are, uh, you know, ripe for destruction, but downtown is not the place to try a big experiment, like removing footnote M so that you could fit more housing where, in my opinion, more business should go. Everybody's complaining there's not enough uh, ways to build more dense housing uh, in that area on Triangle and Prey Street and all of that. But people want more business downtown. And also to just challenge some of the assumptions, as I have said before, the housing study is quite old. I heard somebody who's been involved with town politics for many, many years saying that she heard today that there's actually enough student housing in town and there's several hundred additional dwellings that have been built since the housing study really changed the picture. So I'm just requesting one more time that we slow it down, figure out what it is that we want to do, not have this ready, fire, aim approach of where you shoot arrows at a wall and then paint targets around where the arrows landed. We really need to figure out 
what kind of town we want. And I know that there's some effort on the town council to get that feedback system going, but you would not be a representative government if you found that a lot of people in town don't want the uh, repercussions of what would happen if you remove this footnote or allow this, you know, kind of vague aesthetic uh, a design element. So I'm just saying, let's slow down and do some planning um, before we do some executing. And I know that you are doing planning and I'm not trying to insult anybody's hard work and I can see it's hard work, but I think we're heading in a direction that a lot of people think is bad. So thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. And at this point, we can get into our uh, next item, which is the, the zoning priorities. Again, we're hitting this pretty much on a weekly basis in February and March. And our first topic is a continued discussion about removing footnote M, uh, section six, table three, zoning bylaw, uh, additional lot area per dwelling unit for townhouses and apartments in the RG zoning district. So I will turn this over to uh, Chris. Hello. Um, we have Maureen Pollock tonight to present um, an update on footnote M. And then following Maureen's um, presentation, uh, there'll be questions from the planning board members. And then there's a 10 minute public comment period. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, is everyone, everyone ready? Um, Yes. Well, uh, thank you uh, to everyone for uh, inviting me back to tonight's planning board meeting. Um, as you know, I attended last uh, Wednesday's planning board meeting and provided a PowerPoint, uh, pre a PowerPoint presentation um, beginning the conversation about footnote M, which is part of the dimensional regulations uh, found in the zoning bylaw. And as uh, Pam had mentioned, um, those slides uh, are from last week, I guess that would be the February 10th meeting, uh, should be available on the planning board web page. Um, and tomorrow morning, um, these slides will be made available on the planning board web page as well. Okay, so um, tonight, uh, we're going to um, uh, pick up uh, where we left off from last week and um, we're going to talk about uh, the history of footnote M and how it uh, was adopted into the zoning bylaw. Uh, we'll touch upon uh, the percentage change of uh, and net change of number of units per parcel with footnote M and without footnote M. Um, we'll uh, discuss the uh, topic of, uh, d of determining how many additional units can be added to existing parcels that also maintain the existing use on the lot. And I will provide uh, the board a example that accounts for um, various factors such as lot size, existing use, parking requirements, building and lot coverages and setbacks. So I'm going to, uh, I guess, pass the baton over to Chris, who has done some research about uh, footnote M and how it, how and why it was adopted in the zoning bylaw in the first place. Um, so I'm Chris Brestrup, planning director, and um, hello everybody. Uh, the history of footnote M begins in the spring of 1993 when John Robleski filed a special permit application with the Zoning Board of Appeals to construct a 16 unit development at 22 High Street. That's the location of the current Spruce Ridge townhouses. There was an existing house on the property that contained three apartments and an existing barn. Mr. Robleski proposed to construct 13 townhouses at the rear of the property and retain the three dwelling units that were already in the house. After the public hearing, the Zoning Board of Appeals granted a special permit to construct a reduced number of dwelling units, only 10 new dwelling units, and to renovate the existing house into two dwelling units for a total of 12 dwelling units. The neighbors appealed the ZBA decision and the court upheld the granting of the special permit, but sent the site plan back to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a re review 
regarding an issue related to lot coverage. And the appeal was finally resolved and a building permit was issued in 1998. But meanwhile, while all that was happening um, in the fall of 1993, which was right after the special permit was initially granted, um, and before the, the appeal was resolved, about five years before the appeal was resolved, or actually maybe more like three years. But anyway, the neighbors filed a petition to amend the zoning bylaw to require that there be, in addition to the 12,000 square feet that we know for the first unit, that anybody who was going to come in and create a new development, that there be 15,000 square feet for the first additional unit and 6,000 square feet for each additional dwelling unit of lot area for new townhouses and apartments in the RG zoning district. This became Article 15 of the November 1993 special town meeting. And simultaneously, the petitioners filed a petition to ban the construction of townhouses and apartments in the RG zoning district. The goal of the first pet petition was to cap the number of units per acre at around seven units per acre, rather than the 13 units per acre that were allowed um, with the existing zoning bylaw. The planning board held a public hearing on the proposed zoning amendments on October 6th and October 20th of 1993. And the planning board voted not to support the ban on apartments and townhouses in the RG district because it was too restrictive, but to send it back for a further study. And the planning board voted to support the revision of the dimensional table by a vote of five to one. And that was out of nine members total um, with final wording to be worked out between the petitioner and planning staff. So what ended up uh, coming to town meeting was a proposal to um, not to require the 15,000 square feet for the first additional unit, but to require 6,000 square feet for each additional unit in addition to the 12,000 that is ordinarily required for one dwelling unit on a property in the RG district. Um, and Article 15 was unanimously approved by town meeting on November 8th of 1993. Um, about 12 years later in November of 2005, town meeting voted to reduce the additional square feet per additional dwelling unit to 4,000 square feet. And I still need to research the reasons for this 2005 change. And I'm hoping to have that information for you by next meeting, by the next planning board meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Um, All right. Okay. Maureen? Oh, here. So thanks, Chris. Um, so continuing on. So uh, this was a chart that I showed uh, last week, and I, I just wanted to just sort of repeat it um, because I'm about to show you a figure that is um, based off of this. So uh, on the left side, you'll see uh, this chart, figure one, and then on the right side is figure two. So over here on the left side is um, really outlining the lot area requirements for units using the existing footnote M, which remember uh, on, the, and on the top of um, the screen, it shows you what, what um, the basic minimum lot requirement is in the RG, which is uh, 12,000 square feet and uh, the additional lot area uh, per family or additional unit with footnote M, which is 4,000 square feet. And um, so over here, it shows uh, if you, um, what the requirement for a lot area for three units, you would be required to have 20,000 square feet or uh, almost a half an acre. Um, and on this, on the right side of the, your screen is figure two, and it shows the lot area requirement for un units with Put no M removed, and um, th that would be uh, the requirement as shown up here. It shows the additional lot area wouldn't be 4,000 square feet any longer. It would be 2,500 square feet would be the requirement for the additional lot areas per unit. So um, here it shows the three units would um, 
would require uh, 17,000 square feet. So you could see that the um, the lot area is decreasing while um, oh, is decreasing from what is required with footnote M. And then the chart just shows uh, what what the differences are for each um, amount of units. So if the um, here for t um, for uh, eight units, uh, you would need 40,000 square feet. Uh, which is less, uh, you know, just shy of, uh, of one acre. And um, on the right side with footnote M was removed uh, and you wanted eight, eight units still, uh, you would be required uh, 29,500 square feet, which is um, also um, uh, converts to 0.68 acres. And um, the next slide, whoop, whoop, I'm having, hold on a second. Here. Oh, here we go. The next slide is just showing what you know um, the requirements would be for uh, for these additional uh, unit types, up to 24 units in total here. And so you, you can see um, the with the footnote M and, and and then with it removed. And so um, in Figure Six, this is taking those two slides and showing it a different way. And um, it really sort of um, gives a give, uh, give visual and understanding of uh, taking those tables and now applying them to a, um, a column table here. So here um, again, you would see, um, you know, the same information from the previous slide would show that you would need 20,000 square feet with footnote M um, in order to have three units. And here you can see the, um, the uh, the small incremental decrease of the of the lot area required for uh, three units. Um, it is to note that I you see these lines going up here, and um, so I'll walk you through that. So uh, this bottom line and it's listed down here below the chart as well. The bottom line represents uh, 0.5 acres. This gold yellow line is uh, represents one acre. This blue line represents 1.5 acres. The green line represents two acres. And perhaps this is black line uh, represents 2.5 acres. And so you can see as the uh, amount of, uh, and then of course the blue column represents uh, what the lot area requirement would be for each given amount of units. And the um, orangey red represents if, if uh, footnote M was removed. And so as you can see, as the, um, as the amount of units um, increase with the removal of footnote M, you can see that the lot requirement decreases and um, and so you can see that while you know between units maybe three and eight or nine, they're pretty incremental uh, changes in that the lot area requirement is reduced while the amount of den density allowed on that unit is increased. And um, when you get past eight, nine units allowed on a parcel, you can start seeing a more expansive increase um, of difference um, and um, of between the lot area requirement and the amount of units allowed. And uh, so I wanted to show you sort of that visual um, in your for your consideration. And then here in figure seven, this shows the uh, number of, unfortunately, this is in my way. So hold on a second. The number of units allowed per lot, um, per lot by lot area requirement with or without the footnote M. And let's see here. So this is just a, another visual. So this is actually this figure. So let me back up. So this figure is just showing you just what the requirement is for footnote M and, and without footnote M and uh, for the amount of units by lot size. This is not looking at any parcels in Amherst. This is just math. 
So here in figure seven, this is using, um, as we uh, is using the sample size that we discuss discussed last time, which is that I um, am looking at 343 parcels um, that ultimately are part of the study. And in the previous slides, I list out in the in um, a few in uh, in the presentation of what was excluded um, as part of the study. So, for instance, lot sizes that. Um, that only can accommodate a, a single family home that was removed. Split zone lots were remo removed. Um, what else? Uh, church uh, properties that have churches, town of Amherst properties, cemeteries, parks, things of that nature were all uh, removed from this study. And so um, the study is only um, looking at properties that could uh, you know, realistically be, you know, that could accommodate more units um, and are, you know, not churches and et cetera. Those, those aren't, well, hope, well, who knows, uh, but uh, sort of institutional properties that are uh, not going anywhere. So, so anyways, I digress. So, um, oh, and I guess over here, I, I guess I, re I caught, um, this is from the, the slide from last year. So I, um, I didn't even realize that until now. So, um, this lists what what is excluded, uh, and so this is showing that in the RG, which is you know surrounded by the downtown uh, area, um, is primarily a very uh, are small are small lots. Um, you know, there's a lot of lots that can accommodate you know single family homes, but here we're not we're not looking at that. We're we're specifically looking at you know. Uh, what can accommodate three or more units. So here, um, the blue again is representing the amount of units allowed per, lo per lot with footnote M and the vertical axis here is showing the number of lots. So um, in this first column here, um, 76 units uh, would be um, 76 lots could accommodate three units and uh, the orange uh, footnote M was removed, um, it would actually slightly decrease uh, to 72 units. Um, and, uh, but you, you can see uh, this is sort of an exception um, it, of why it sort of decreased, I think, because it jumped to the, ne the next available uh, amount of units. Um, but here you can start seeing that there's a gradual increase of the amount of units on a lot. Um, if footnote M was removed. So you can see the small incremental change for lots that, accommodate, that could accommodate three units, four units, five units, six units, seven units. And then you actually see a, a pretty dramatic decrease for properties that could accommodate eight units. And that might just because there's just not enough of those specific parcels in the RG that could accommodate that type of development. Um, uh, and, um, but again, there's um, the, the majority of lots that are part of this study are uh, smaller lots. And um, here you can start seeing that there's actually, a, you know, um, a, here is a, a small incremental increase of units that could be uh, added to, to lots. Here you can start seeing, maybe uh, you would argue that this is a moderate increase of the amount of units that could be allowed on each uh, parcel. And um, while there are not a lot of them of larger lots that could accommodate this, um, it, it, it should be said that, um, and which is uh, outlined here, that the larger lot you have actually accommodates a significantly am amount of um, more of units. And that's something that should be considered. Here, why, why it kind of gets a little vague here is just because there's just, there aren't any larger lots. So um, I, I did consider it actually just chopping this off and not including it, but I, I wanted to be consistent where I'm all, in each slide, if I go up to 24 units. Um, so thus far, we've only looked at lot sizes in respect of 
um, the amount of units that could be uh, allowed with footnote M or, or without footnote M. And that's only solely based on the lot area. We haven't factored in anything else. We haven't uh, analyzed what the existing uses are on the parcel, what the parking requirements are, what the building and lot coverages are, uh, setbacks, floors, building height, um, the possibility of combining parcels and um, demolition of existing structures. Um, so here, um, this shows, um, so at the last planning board meeting, um, planning board members had asked, so, oh, you know, I, I like your maps, but is there a way that we can sort of combine them and show sort of the net change? Um, and so uh, this is what I came up with. <laughs> so this shows, um, here shows uh, with this um, color range here shows what the number of units allowed per lot with footnote M currently. So this is what, again, we're not looking what the uses are currently or setbacks and building and lot coverage. So this is purely just looking at the lot size with, with the consideration of footnote M, which requires 4,000 square feet. So you can see that, that overwhelmingly, uh, a lot of the parcels that are part of the study uh, that are in the RG zoning district are this are smaller lots. They're they're um, you know they're half they're half acre lots, um, uh, acre a lot. You know uh, I would say a half acre to two acres are are um, the majority of lots that are part of this study. And so the net change, and you'll see all these little numbers. I'll explain that. Is that if footnote M was to be removed, which then would require that the additional lot area would be then 2,500 square feet instead of the 4,000 square feet, that, um, for instance, I'm just going to randomly pick one, that this, like, if you can see where my mouse is sort of circling here, which is along the southern side of Chestnut Street, is that that lot currently, you know, could, um, you know, provide uh, you know, uh, maybe th uh, th um, three or, or four uh, parcels, cur um, three or four lot, uh, units, sorry, uh, currently. And the number represents that they could add three more. And so that would be the net increase. Um, and so you'll see these gray ones, uh, gray parcels where you can see my mouse, hopefully that's uh, hovering over the Eastern side of Lincoln Ave that gray parcel represents that that's a dupl that um, a duplex could be currently um, um, constructed there, or you know that could be placed there, and that if footnote M was eliminated, that you could add actually one more. So that would be a total of three. Um, that would be a total of three units there, and so you sort of get the sense of how many um, additional units could be allowed and um, this data this map shows that on average we're talking about for for a good chunk of these uh, sample lots if you will um, you know you're going to typically see you know one or two or three additional units could be provided um, and um, and uh, but then you you do see that there are some lots uh, that could accommodate um, more, uh, you know this one on. Hmm, oh, I know what that street. I forget that street is called. But um, you can see that there are some that could accommodate more. Um, here's a here's one on Triangle uh, or Mass Ave. Oh oh, this is the vacant property um, that the old frat houses used to be on. So they could actually um, have uh, 11 additional units if they if they ever decide to do anything with that property. But anyways, you can um, get a sense of, of um, how many additional units could be added to these properties uh, as in, in the RG. And so this next slide shows, um, I wanted to break down and provide a visual of 
of the properties in the RG that are part of the uh, of our study here, um, this lighter green represents the properties that are up to and half an acre. And so you can see these sort of lighter proper uh, lighter colored parcels along Lincoln, um, and they're sort of you know sprinkled around uh, the neighborhoods, and then the um, brighter green are parcels that are um, with are uh, between a half an acre to one acre. Um, and then um, the red represents anything that is over one acre. And uh, the reason why I did this was with the thinking of, um, you know, I, I look forward to our discussion at this end of this slideshow is is that if we go back to this slide which where is the line here this is the um this represents one acre um you know once we sort of get to one acre um you can see that the amount of units allowed um or the opportunity to add um additional units per lot really uh, increases uh, in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in a more expansive way than for what could be allowed for lots that are under one acre. And so um, another consideration to think about is um, combining lots. So, oh, wrong one. So, um, say if you have three or four small little lots and then you combine them and then suddenly you have an acre and a half or two acres uh you know that could be something that could be great or maybe maybe for some people that might not be great um and as i had just said in the or showed in the previous slide is once you kind of get over an acre you can see sort of a, a real you know, increase in the amount of units allowed. So it's just something, um, it's just data. So um, I wanted to uh, just mention that. Um, and then here I wanted to provide, I, was all, I, I ran out of time. I, I, I was able to provide one example um, and I wanted to provide a couple more, but here, here it is, here's my one example. So this, this property, or let's see here, so, um, before I get into the property. I wanted to look at the existing use on the, on the parcel. I wanted to look at the parking requirements and the dimensional regulations set, such as like lot frontage, building a lot, building a lot coverages, uh, floor and building height. And so um, here I wanted to give a little calculation so everyone can um, follow along here. So I am in this example, um, I am proposing um, that this this two family home, which is located along Amity Street, perhaps could um, could this turn into a six unit apartment building. And so uh, we want to um, look at well, what the what would the lot requirement be lot area requirement be so again you would take the basic minimum lot area. Uh, and that would be used for the first unit. So that would be 12,000 square feet. And then the additional lot area per uh, each uh, additional unit would be, um, would be uh, 2,500 square feet. So that's if footnote M was removed and multiply that by five, um, five being the five additional units so uh, that would be 12,500 square feet. So the 12,500 12, square feet plus the 12,000 square feet equals 24,500 square feet or 0.44 acres. So that would be the lot area required for a six unit apartment building if footnote M was removed. Okay, so, um, so uh, I guess, uh, yeah, so we know that it's a two family home um, the lot is 20,000, that is 20, 20, uh, 27,918 square feet or 0.64 acres. 
um, and that um, you know the the lot area requirement for a two-family home is fourteen thousand five hundred square feet, and they could add up to four additional units. And so that that was uh, uh, um, we already know that. So let's see here. So um, this is um, I'll just walk you through this quickly here. This is showing uh, 15 feet, if you see this line here, that represents the front setback. The 10 feet on the westerly side of the property represents the 10 foot side setback side, and then rear setback is also 10 feet. And on the easterly property line, that's also 10 feet. And I uh, calculated what the, um, uh, the, the building and law coverage would be. Um, for the existing uh, use here. And um, so let's see here. So the uh, existing building coverage is 9% or 2,624,000 square feet. And the, um, if you go to your table three, the requirement would be, let's see here, 25,000 square feet uh, or 25%, sorry, it would be 25%. Um, so they meet that and um, the existing lot coverage is 19% or 5,314 square feet. And they meet the lot coverage requirement for that, which would be 40% 40, uh, 40 and um, just to say they meet all the requirements for the lot frontage, the setbacks and the lot area. Um, I unfortunately I actually don't know what how many floors um, are so, uh, the floors associated with this house or the building height. I believe anecdotally it's uh, a two uh, has two floors. I'm not sure what the height is, and there's at least two parking spaces provided. And so for each per dwelling unit, there are there's a requirement for two parking spaces for each unit. So they meet that as well. And so here, um, and I also would like to put a disclaimer that this, I used uh, GIS Viewer, which is a, on the town website. It's a web-based GIS and it is a planning tool. And so this is um, just a concept and is not, um, I'm not a surveyor or anything like this. So this is just a quick and dirty uh, um, estimate of, you know, what the setbacks and coverages are. Um, and so here I am, again, propose, I'm, I'm not proposing anything, but I am seeing, you know, could six units uh, be put on this property uh, total? Um, and if so, what would that look like? And so, um, so as I had said, two parking spaces are required per unit. So they would be required to have 12 parking spaces. Um, and so, you know, I line it around here, you know, who knows, it could wrap around. This is just a, a just a visual. Um, there is also a, um, a parking um, in the zoning bylaw, you know, an applicant could actually ask for a parking uh, reduction for parking spaces, you know, to from like two parking spaces to one or, or, or something similar to that. Um, and um, so, but that's that's a whole other conversation. Um, and let's see here. So, and also I, um, this was the original uh, footprint of the building and I added uh, a, a, another uh, section, which is uh, additional 900 square feet, um, which would total it to be um, a building with a footprint of 3,531 square feet. Uh, it would meet the building and law coverage. And, you know, there would be enough space for open space for stormwater uh, treatment on the property. Uh, you know, uh, if, a, if they had like a um, trash pickup that came um, and, you know, if they had a dumpster or what have you, or just bins the you know, the, you know, there, I, I would say that there should be enough room for that vehicle to also come down and turn around. You know, maybe that would get expanded out here. But um, since they are well below what the what the 
building and lock coverage requirements are, you know, if needed, they could expand the, the building more or the parking area or, or, you know, have provide more walkways or what have you. Um, and so let's see here. So that is just giving a snapshot of what could um, a redevelopment project look like on, on a property in, in this study area. And so for next steps, um, let's see here. Uh, I would love to hear your input, but I was, I was thinking, you know, do we, does the planning board want to consider if footnote M should be considered for lot sizes that are more than one acre or does the planning board want to limit it to, you know, less than one acre? Um, I would also, you know, be curious to, to determine how many additional units could be added to existing parcels that maintain the existing uses. So that example that I just walked you through does address that. It'd be interesting to see, um, you know, maybe uh, seeing what a whole neighborhood would look like in reality of looking at what are the current uses and um, providing more examples um, to get a real sense of what, what what could be possible given the parking requirements and the lot cover, uh, the lot and building um, coverages and uh, requirements and all the all the the dimensional regulation requirements, and um, and then uh, and then of course maybe if the board wants to see other examples, um, and um, it'd be interesting to see what what would what would it look like if if parcels were combined. Um, and I think that was it. Questions, comments? So um, just that last slide was informative. I was gonna, do, um, do we have this presentation, Maureen? You will, yeah, or I think will. it was emailed to you um, in the last couple hours. Mm -hmm. And Pam will um, upload it to the planning board webpage tomorrow morning. Okay. So I'm going to let, uh, well, Chris, you have some comments first. Yeah, I just wanted to note that um, when we planning staff and Rob Mora were looking at this, um, we realized that there was kind of a break point around um, one acre and um, beyond one acre of lot size, you started to get more and more dwelling units per property. And so we started to consider the idea of removing footnote M for properties that were one acre or less, and that would allow infill, but it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be large scale infill. It would be on the order of, you know, one, two, three, four units per property. Um, and not taking footnote M away for properties that are over one acre, and that would do a couple of things. It would discourage large developments, but it would also discourage, um, you know, sort of combining of properties and knocking down existing buildings. So we thought that was um, kind of a good direction to move in. And we wanted to make that suggestion to you that that's something that um, you might consider or we might consider in proposing, um, you know, not eliminating footnote M for properties that are over one acre, but potentially eliminating it for properties under one acre that would give you the kind of developments that are more in scale with the um, neighborhood. And, and, and with that, um, the number of lots that are eligible greater than one acre, is it what a dozen or so? Yeah, it's not a lot. I could, uh, let me pull that slide up. Give me a second. Um, let's see here. Which one would be a good one? This. Mm -hmm. um, your question was how many how many lots are greater than one acre? Ye and, and yeah, that are eligible. Uh, yeah. yeah, let's see here. This. Yep. So this map shows that you know the majority. Um, uh, oh, I forgot to point this out. I pointed it out last week. So the lighter green shows that there are 117 parcels that are less than one acre. 
there's a hundred um, hundred there are 180 parcels that are between a half an acre and one acre and then there are 46 parcels that are between one acre and, and six acres thank you thank you um yeah that sounds like a good good proposal uh chris uh doug thanks for that presentation maureen sure. whoops am i still yeah i'm fine can you hear me yes yes okay good um i guess it, it your if we're one example made me think uh you know i don't know if that's enough of enough of a of examples but I think the question is whether parking and the setbacks would temper or reduce the apparent increase in units by removing this footnote. The example you showed suggested that parking and the setbacks are not a uh, a drag. You know, they don't they don't reduce the actual number of units that could be uh added or you know the capacity of the lot um is that have you looked at this enough to know that in fact that's generally the case that setbacks and parking are not going to be reducing the numbers you've been showing us well i would say that since um, the majority of lots are on the smaller end that providing additional units uh it's only going to add you know one or two or three more units i think for the majority of 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 the parcels so there wouldn't be a, a dramatic increase of parking spaces i will say that the larger lots the lots that were shown in red uh, and, and lots that are greater than one acre that's where you start seeing that the, there's a real sort of um increase of units that could be allowed which then um would you know factor in a, a greater need of parking so if you have now a unit uh, a parcel that requires uh, that could you have sorry that you could have 20 more units that would be 20 times two um so that would be 40 park parking spaces uh, which that is you know that's that's a good good amount of parking but um i would say again the majority of units uh, majority of lots sorry are um on the smaller end so i i don't think that parking would would be a overwhelming um concern um that being all said i mean we would have to look at you know where the house is placed currently on the property um what the building and lot coverage um uh, looks like um but that's i guess that's an that's like another conversation so it, it's everything affects one another but yeah i think for the smaller lots parking or setbacks wouldn't be in, uh, impactful thank you is that is that good doug yeah i guess so thank you mm -hmm. uh, janet So um, th thank you for that presentation, Maureen. I, I can't tell you how much that helps me and just seeing the different ways and the lot, um, just going lot by lot that, I mean, everything you've done has created a better picture in my mind about the effects of this change. And I, I do think we could look at it more ways in terms of build out and things like that. But, you know, I'm sort of wondering like, what what is precipitating this change because it looks to me that, you know, when I look at the current zoning in RG, it's zoned for a lot more density that we see. And some, you know, some of the houses do have, you know, four or five or six units in them. And, um, you know, the idea of adding three or four more, I think would really, you know, change the character of the RG. And so I just don't know what the impetus here is, because we have a district that's zoned for a lot more density. And now we're zoning it for even more density in a way that would sort of push for more apartments and townhouses. Um, and then we're doing it without inclusionary zoning, protection of historic properties, no design st standards, you know, questions of you know, no real owner occupancy. And then 
we know that there is a huge demand for undergraduates to live close to the university. So that will have another impact on neighborhoods. So I'm just kind of like wondering, like, you know, why are we there? And so the way I kind of look at it is when I was looking at um, Maureen's chart about the lot area requirements for units under footnote M and then removing it. And if, if you could pull that up, Maureen, maybe the first chart for the, the smaller. Sure. Unit. Oh, sure. Uh, you might have to guide me up it's which figure which... it's I think it's figure one. On... Oh, perfect. Um, although I'm looking at an old, oh, good, thank you. Oh, I can go back to um, the last, do you want me to go back to last week's? No, no, we can just stay with yours. I, I'm, I'm looking oh, sure. at an old one, but whatever, I think it was on page, it's, it's the one that says lot area requirement for units using existing footnote one, and it starts with three and goes down. Oh, two yeah. Columns. Um, back a little bit, maybe. Oh, yeah. but it was. Yeah. Um, Next one. This one? Oops. The... <laughs> Sorry, this... Sorry. Oh, oh, this one. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. So, you know, the way I could visualize it is I live on three quarters of an acre. And so I see that under the existing zoning, I could have six units in my house, you know, or, you know, on my lot. And then if I look at three quarters of an acre, or 0.73, I have nine units. And so to me, I think six, six units of housing on three quarters of an acre seems pretty hardy, um, you know, because you know, that's a that's a lot of people. And, you know, if there's three people in the house, that's 18. If there's four, that's 24 people living on three quarters of an acre. And then when I go to nine, that's a lot more people. And so I'm just kind of wondering, like, what, you know, isn't this, you know, you know, we, it seems like town meeting and the neighborhood have come in and sort of said, you know, we can increase density to a certain level. This is what we'd like to see. We still haven't seen build out in RG. So why are we here, like looking to increase density again in a way that I think would really fundamentally change the character of the neighborhoods, even at the smaller lot size or, you know, between half an acre to an acre, you can go up to, you know, from nine units on an acre to 13 or 14. And that's a lot more people. That's a lot more density. That's a lot more cars. It's a lot more building. And if it all looked great, maybe that's where, you know, maybe in 20 or 30 years, we might think that's okay to be there. But I don't really understand why, why we're, I don't, I don't understand what the goal is or what we're trying to do here when we already have a, 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 a zoning area that's do, that is zoned for a lot more density. Thank you. Um, Nate. Sure. Uh, thanks. Can everyone? Uh, I, I was, you know, hiding for a minute. The um, I was going to respond to a few comments, uh, Doug. I think, you know, about the parking and lot coverage. I think there's a lot of variables there, and I think the difficulty is, you know, how would someone determine um, if they're going to tear down a, the existing structure and add on? So in Marine's example, you know, it could be likely that someone may run up against lot coverage if they um, you know, if they don't do such a compact development. So, you know, I, you know, there's just so many variables. So I think that, you know, in parking, um, you know, may or may not be an issue. So, you know, this, this lot is pretty big here. It's, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, it's almost three quarters of an acre. So I think on some of the smaller lots, depending, you know, I don't, I don't know if it would be profitable for, for someone to tear down the house just to add two two more units. So my thought is they would add on outside the existing footprint. And so, I mean, that, you know, that's just an assumption. And so I don't, you know, at some point you, you know, someone would have to do the math in terms of, is it worthwhile to tear down the existing structure and add, add a few units or can, you know, can you do that with a lot and building coverage or not? So I think that, you know, I think there's, <clears throat> I can't say that staff's examined it enough. I think there are so many different options that could happen with, you know, redeveloping a property. Um, and then Janet, the, most of the properties in Maureen's map, it, you know, along Lincoln, there's 200 properties in the local historic district. And so uh, it's outlined in kind of a dark gray on this map, but, mm -hmm. you know, many of those properties would be subject to review by the local historic district commission. So if any of this, these changes are visible from a public way, which I imagine they would be, you know, it would have to be approved by the local historic district. So you know, although there aren't necessarily design standards for apartments or townhouses, you know, there is the local historic district bylaw that would be reviewing, 
you know, changes. And then there's a Dickinson district. So, you know, that encompasses, you know, 260 properties or so that would be 250 properties that would be subject to a local historic district review. The, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's it. I, I think, um, you know, the local historic district can be a really good tool. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's different layers of review that would happen. And so it's hard to say, you know, if, if the ZBA, you know, also has the, the design review principles they could, could use too as a review project. So there are some standards that could be applied. That's all. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of Nate, um, you know, uh, well, uh, th that these sorts of projects, um, you know, two or more units would be required to go through the planning board or the ZBA for a special permit. Um, yeah, um, okay, uh, Andrew. You want to let, Chris, do you want to go first? Um, I just wanted to note, and I'm glad that Nate is here, that um, our housing market study said that we needed like, I don't know, how many, Nate, 700 more right. units? Many hundred. Um, and that was back in 2015. So um, what we're doing here is looking for potential for infill. Um, rather than having, you know, large apartment buildings um, at the outskirts of town um, or, you know, on the highway or whatever, there, there's potential for infill in the neighborhoods where people could walk to services, walk to the bus, walk to UMass, walk to Amherst College. Um, so, you know, infill in the RG district um, is a good thing as long as we don't overwhelm or, you know, change the character of the RG district. So I just wanted to add that. Good to know. Thank you, Chris. Andrew? Thanks, Jack. Um, Maureen, another really thought provoking presentation. Uh, and I'm, I'm still absorbing it. Uh, so I don't have like many formulated questions at this point. But one, I was wondering just based off of Janet's comment. Um, and if, if I've seen if you show this, and I missed it, then like sincere apologies. But um, we, we have, this is all sort of geared towards the number of units allowed. Do we have, do, do we have good data of how many units are currently there? I'm glad that you're asking that. Um, I need to, um, I need to get that data. So, um, which is available. Um, I just, uh, there needs to be some data cleaning to get to that. So that's going to take a little time to, um, okay to get but i think that is an important question um to have for the board's consideration of what's there now and you know what's there in reality and uh you know if if someone wants to add more units what would that look like um and to provide sort of real real examples um, and to see that on uh, the site scale, but also to zoom out and look at the whole sample of uh, the whole study. Yeah, you're, you're reading my mind. I think we've been, this is, I, I like in the delta between footnote M and not, uh, or removing footnote M, but it seems like we need the first piece, right? Of like, here's what you have today, the delta to what you have today with footnote M and without footnote M um, would be, I think pretty fascinating and then and getting some aggregate summaries of that so like we are just with our current zoning we could accommodate on paper an additional 300 units and by making these changes that increases by you know another two or 300 mm -hmm. uh I, i'd love to see that um and yeah i'm with you i was pulling down some of the data myself and it's there's a lot of cleaning that needs to happen so like i will just acknowledge like the effort that you put in here to probably clean this was significant. I, I know I was running into a lot of challenges. So um, anyhow, again, great visuals. Um, I like the story and I would just make that, that at least right now, that, that one recommendation of, of getting the, the baseline units um, added if you can. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I like that, Andrew. So you, you only had a week, right, to kind of pull this together because we just mm -hmm. <laughs> great. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Oh. 
yeah, that's good. But uh, so maybe, you know, one or two more slides and, and we'll be home. Uh, um, but yeah, I see that. Good. Uh, Doug? Yeah, um, I guess uh, I had a couple of comments. One is uh, just kind of thinking about what Andrew just said. Um, it's it's interesting from it's just interesting to have the existing number of units and the existing number that could that, that is the capacity of the district uh, under the current zoning with footnote M. But the actual evidence is it's not profitable right now to add units in RG because we don't see much happening. And I guess the question is, what, would we see more units being added in RG if we took away footnote M and allowed a couple of more units uh, on uh, lots of these little parcels? That might spur a little bit more infill building, uh, and it might actually be profitable and then it might happen because it's not happening now. So then the second thing, um, I guess there's kind of a lot of dancing around not changing the character of the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, the, I think it's a question of the pace of change. And what we're talking about is would this would this would removal of this footnote result in a change that was dramatic enough to be highly objectionable and you know spur a lot of uh, distaste in town and and resentment? Um, because you know we could we could allow a lot of development and it would happen. And then we'd have a solution to the 700 acre or 700 units that we need. Uh, and we'd have a lot more people who aren't driving around. Um, but I think it's a question of whether we and particularly town council think that what they're gonna allow is politically palatable to their constituents. Very good, very good, Doug. Um, Chris, off the top of your head, do you, do you know how many, you know, lots in the RG have, uh, you know, done, you know, expansion in the last couple of years, uh, pursuant to? Very few. It's what? one one unit here and there, and Maureen could probably speak to that better than I can, um, because she deals with the Zoning Board of Appeals, yeah. and they're the ones who have to approve. Um, you know, com converted dwellings and two family houses and, and all of those things. So I, I don't think there's been much um, development on that scale in the RG in recent years. Okay. Uh, but I, 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 I like your comments, Doug, because yeah, I, yeah, there's not been much going on then. Uh, it's a good, good observation. Uh, Maria? Uh, thanks, Maureen. This was great change uh, that you from what you showed last week, and um, I agree with Andrew. I, I I wanted from last week just to see that delta, that change from what we have to what we could have, and I know that's a ton of work, but maybe you can just focus on like uh, a street on, in the local historic district, or you know, a certain certain areas, not all 300 parcels. And then the other point that keeps coming up that I want to make sure is not taken as fact, is that every time people say like, okay, it goes from six units to nine units, that's a difference of 24 people to, uh, you know, 36 people, those square footages in particular, that option you showed, um, you know, you can't really get four units, four people per unit for all these scenarios you're showing. So people kind of keep saying, you know, each unit could have four people and then that's, you know, that many more parking spaces. I just want to be careful that we're not assuming like worst case scenario every single time because the point of this, I think is unlocking more infill housing and it's doing exactly that. And I like that suggestion Chris gave where, you know, the staff studied that really for one acre or less, 
those kinds of impacts would be more in, in, in tune or in kind of with the neighborhoods. And um, I think that's a good point. And maybe one study, Maureen, is to just take one of those larger parcels and see if, you know, that prediction you have in your chart actually can come true based on setbacks and parking, because it's it may not be like that. Um, you end up actually having that number of units possible due to site constraints for um, parking and setbacks. But um, overall, I think it's getting really close and, and showing us like the path ahead. And I, I really liked the green and red chart you showed. But I think like Andrew said, just one more step is just like what's actual versus possible would be great. Because I think that one is just showing math right now. But overall, I think, yeah, it's incrementally getting there every week. So I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks. You know, no, I, I would just add that, like, um, you know, in these examples, I'm not getting into how many bedrooms are in these uh, units. So it could be a one bedroom apartment, or it could be a three bedroom apartment. So it's like, how, that could also dictate how many parking spaces are required. So, uh, or, or could if they wanted to ask for like a parking waiver, for instance, um, so I, I could play around with that sort of um, breakdown for some of the examples too. Thank you, Maureen and Maria. Thank you, uh, Janet. So um, I'm hesitant to say, um, you know, why, you know, I don't know how much build that has happened. You know, I know when I was looking at property cards, there seemed to be some condos, some two families and things like that. Um, I'm hesitant to say that more build out hasn't happened because it's financially infeasible because I don't really know the answer to that. And so I don't want to like jump to conclusions like I think the people who own those properties could probably answer that question more. I would imagine that, you know, I, when I was looking at property cards, a lot of them are owned by the owners live there and so they may not want to have build a you know, four unit apartment in their backyard. I have seen those, you know, and I see increasing condos, you know, close to the core. Um, so I don't want to jump to conclusions and say it's not financially feasible because I haven't seen any numbers and I don't know how much that would cost. Um, I, it's very likely that people really like living in the RG and they're happy there or don't want to, you know, put the money into that, you know, they don't want to invest the money because, you know, it might be financially feasible. They just don't want to do the project. So, um, so I, so I just wanted to say that. And then, the other thing is, is the reason I brought up inclusionary zoning and protecting historic properties and neighborhoods, historic neighborhoods or the quality and character, small town character of Amherst and design standards and talk about owner occupancy and the issue of students is because the master plan talks about all those. And so I'm, I'm wondering why, you know, I feel like I support increases in density, but there's no controls. We have no controls on that, on what it will look like. We have no inclusionary zoning that's comprehensive. Um, there are historic properties that are protected in the RG, and it's largely been a very defensive move by the neighbor, the owners who didn't want to see the changes that were coming around them. And, and when you're in a historic district, you can increase the density of the apartment, you can add on to your house, you just control the look of it and someone's overseeing that. You know, the entire downtown is historic. I mean, it's filled with historic buildings. The RG is filled, the entire RG, most of it is historic buildings. Um, we could make it into a historic district um, and the master plan does call for the downtown properties to be protected um, or we can do protect it with design standards too. We're not doing any of those things. And so, you know, the master plan doesn't say just increase density without these other things. It's saying, consider all these things and do them simultaneously. And so if, if the town council had said, let's do, let's, let's do some RG planning or you know, let's do some downtown planning or let's protect the character of Amherst, let's you know, do the inclusionary zoning, let's have design standards as we increase density, I'm completely behind that. But I'm, I'm bringing up these issues not to be a naysayer, but just to say, that's what our master plan says we should do. So I think we should do that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Janet, do you have a, like, with the inclusionary zoning, do you have some sort of a, a concept of, you know, that in mind that, that, that you want to propose? 
Uh, oh, you're, you're muted. muted. I'd like to follow the rule. Um, the housing production plan in the housing market study all called for a comprehensive inclusionary zoning um, of 15% for 10 or more units. Um, in the zoning subcommittee over a year ago, we were looking at two op three options for you know how we would do a comprehensive inclusionary zoning. I've actually sent two to Chris and um, I think Rob. Um, there was one that almost passed town meeting um, that you know has I see some problems with it, but it's something we could do. It's it's not it's not super hard. I think to to I mean there's ways we can just expand our existing inclusionary zoning to cover all permits. You know the language change is very simple, and there's they there's a density increase that you get for that, or you can get a tax benefit or a tax break. So I, you know to me, I think we're just going to keep on bumping up against this issue of. Let's, but I also, I don't think they're competing interests. I don't think the character of a neighborhood or historic protection is like anti-density. I think that you can do both, but we can't do the density increase without the design standards. And, you know, I keep on sending those excerpts from the master plan because I'm just kind of like saying like, let's do that and let's do that simultaneously. So Chris, can you help me out on, on this a little bit? Nate, Nate has his hand up. Maybe he'll speak to this. Um, Nate? Sure. I, I can't speak to everything, but I, I will say that um, staff is looking at updating the inclusionary zoning bylaw to capture, you know, all development except for the subdivision of land. I think, Janet, you raise an interesting question. Um, you know, most of the thresholds are 10 units or more. So most inclusionary zoning bylaws and communities wouldn't capture an incremental change in units. You know, I just wrote a note to myself, you know, is it, would there be a different formula for ownership for, you know, compared to rental development? So, you know, there is some things to consider, but typically, you know, anything under nine units is not captured by inclusionary zoning. Uh, just, you know, it's, it's a, such a small, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of numbers there. Um, and I, I was just gonna say two more things. One is Maureen was really gracious in saying she could get the actual number of units and I don't want to say our data is flawed, but it's not really well kept in terms of number of units on a property. So, you know, there isn't a simple place in our permitting software where it says, you know, this property has three units, this property has four units. It's, it's you know, based on uh, the property card, it's based on permitting, and so it does take a lot of work. And so, I, you, know, I, you know, I just want to say that. And Maria, I like your idea of maybe doing a sample area because it really isn't a way to just, uh, aggregate the data and then filter it. It's really, I mean, Marina almost has to read like every property card and go through permitting history to verify the number of units because a supplemental dwelling on a property, you know, may not be on the assessor's record. So it might just say it's a single family home, but it has a supplemental dwelling. So it's actually two units. So it actually is a really difficult thing to do. And, you know, she said she could do it, but I just want to say <laughs> thank you for speaking up, Nate. <laughs> it is a lot of work. It is a lot it of work. Is. And I think, yeah. you know, the town's getting some new software and, you know, we've discussed this with staff that it'd be great to have some of these fields that aren't necessarily permitting requirements, but would be great for, uh, you know, planning studies or reporting out on data. So there's a number of things that, you know, I've been speaking with the assessor that she'd love to have uh, in, in, in software, just so when we ask for these these numbers or these these statistics, we can gather them a lot quicker. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that almost every use that Marine has, or that we'd envision happening with new units, would probably be regulated by special permit. So you know we haven't we're not changing the permitting path uh, yet. So you know unless it's an affordable duplex, everything else typically would be by special permit. Um, you know to add these numbers of units and. To Janet's point, I mean, we could have a requirement that they all have an owner occupancy requirement. So I don't know if that's necessarily been considered, but I, I agree that there's probably conditions that we could write into, you know, the use standards if we think something like this would move forward and we're worried about, you know, changing from ownership properties to then all rental properties. So, you know, I, I think that there probably are conditions if this moves further along that we could have, you know, maybe there's a standard set of conditions or parameters we could apply you know, to different uses if, you know, if this moves forward. But, and, you know, I like that idea of having, you know, having a few different conditions. I guess I could raise my hand. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nate. Uh, oh, 
Maureen, you had your hand raised? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, I think that part of the zoning amendment uh, work that the planning department is doing is that we're also going to look at the definition of apartments and uh, perhaps townhouses and uh, uh, and then go, uh, look at the actual section for each of those. So this could be, a, you know, a really great opportunity to, you know, consider everyone's comments tonight um, as as the town is, is I believe, is, is going to um, also look at those um, sections. Very good. Um, yeah, the, the owner occupied stipulation I've, I've heard mixed things from some folks on the zba that that it's you know really enhancing that particular property that they're, they're <laughs> um but i can't really put my finger on what the exact conversation was but um andrew thanks jack <clears throat> um i i was just reacting or thinking nate about what you'd mentioned um about the difficulty of getting that information. And I guess, is it, so So a couple of part question is, is the difficulty just getting that down to the parcel level, right? Or is the, is the issue like, we don't really have it? Um, it in, it's, it, okay. yeah, I was sorry. gonna say, um, so um, it's in decisions, it's in special permit decisions or site plan approval decisions and for whatever reason it's um that some of these land use types are reflected in decisions and are not being translated into our like parcels layer that you know in our attribute table uh, okay we're speaking we're speaking in language now but like um yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that no one that, else can understand but uh it's not getting it's not getting exported into excel into uh programs that we can just you know easily click of a button and identify that there's a supplemental dwelling unit at a uh, on a property or that there is you know um a six unit building um um, and the, uh, the way that I would have to look into that, for example, would be going to the rental permit, which is on our web-based GIS program. Um, but it's um, but it's 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 dive it's it's researching different links and different documents to find the answer. It's not in just one database already, uh, which is unfortunate. But as Nate had said, that you know the you know the planning department. You know we're we're very interested in coming up with a, a uniform system that when there are permits that are you know coming through that that be recorded. So for scenarios such as this, um, we don't have to waste you know or sp spend not waste but spend uh, uh, you know a decent amount of hours of now researching it. So. Got it. Yeah, I, I would then I would sort of echo Maria's point of, um, you know, doing that small like a deep dive for a small subset that mm -hmm. I think that would be particularly useful because it it does just make me sort of squeamish um, that you know like I think to, to Janet's original question of like why are we even here is is do we really have a sense of what the problem is like we know that there's a there is a a shortage of housing, but I'm I'm now like questioning how the math was actually determined to figure that out, uh, and I think being able to say, well, this is what we have for actual units. This is you know again what we think we can build will really help us understand uh, this much better. So, um, thanks. Yeah, w one comment I have is like in terms of the the you know, reviewing these things, you know, looking to simplify the bylaws and with the stipulation that we have it for, you know, we keep zone, uh, footnote M for, for, you know, lots of that are larger than one acre. It's, there's still going to be a, a footnote M sort of thing. <laughs> so, uh, but again, that that's more uh, just, you know, a logistical uh, point to this, but 
Uh, Doug. Like a lowercase or uppercase N instead. Jack. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Jack, I just I wondered if Nate could or Chris could uh, talk a little more about situations with owner occupancy. Um, I guess I'm a little bit hesitant to try to make that a condition of 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 most uh, zoning regulations, because it seems like, you know, if you have somebody who is the owner occupant and they die. Does everybody else get kicked out, you know? Uh, or and you're you're probably depressing the value of the property because if you have to be the owner occupancy to have all of the units occupied uh you know there's only so many people who want to actually live in a multi-family lot so i guess i'm just curious whether anybody on town staff has has had good experience or bad experience with owner occupants versus non-owner occupants I guess I could also see that if owner occupancy is really required, you know, an owner might contract with a property manager to just manage the complex for them and they'll just stay living there, but they won't have to deal with it. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Chris? Do you want to say it? So some things are automatically owner occupied, like supplemental apartments. If you have a supplemental apartment, one of the two units has to be owner occupied. If you have an, a duplex that was permitted by, um, by site plan review in the RG zoning district, and it uh, therefore needs to be um, owner occupied, that's part of its permit. Um, the plan, the Zoning Board of Appeals chooses to put an owner occupancy condition on some units, but for the most part, that's not a very common, um, it used to be a common condition, but I think these days it's not a very common condition because of uh, the rental registration that we have. Um, I think the ZBA has become more comfortable with a resident manager, um, which Maureen could speak to in more detail. But I think, you know, commonly we don't require owner occupancy unless there's some peculiarity about the property that would, you know, that would warrant that. Um, so that, that's kind of my answer, but Maureen may have more detail about that. So in my uh, experience with uh, working with the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, and uh, hearing from, you know, inspection services uh, frequently that um, sort of the, the problem properties um, have nothing to do with the owner, uh, whether the, uh, the property is owner occupied or not. And that the, the, the real issue um, that has been uh, observed is that you know, the sort of problem properties are properties that don't have any special permit or site plan review associated with it. And so, for example, um, single family homes um, are uh, by right use, regardless if it's owner occupied or not. And th th that means that um, there aren't any uh, conditions that are placed on that uh, property for upkeeping and for noise and park and parking and lighting and and um, things of that nature and so uh, um, inspection services has difficulty you know enforcing these properties that don't have a special permit uh, associated with it and they're um, and so when there is a special permit for instance, placed on a apartment building, a duplex, a converted dwelling, a supplemental detached unit, the list goes on, um, that it gives teeth for, you know, DPW, fire, police, inspection services to go out and enforce complaints that they've heard from abutters or, uh, or whatnot. And so it gives it more um, sort of teeth or power t for the town to enforce. Um, so um, as Chris mentioned, there are, you know, du duplexes, uh, you can get a, um, in the bylaw, there could be an owner occupied duplex or a non owner occupied duplex um, for a converted dwelling. Um, you know, there is a criteria that could require that 
that could be owner occupied or that there's a resident manager. Um, really the other ones, apartments, townhouses, um, they don't get into whether uh, they need to be owner occupied or not. Um, and so there are, you know, it, it, it's, it has been pretty common for, for um, a lot, uh, a good amount of special permits that have come through that uh, professional property managers are the ones that are maintaining the, these properties. Um, and again, when there are conditions put on place on these special permits, um, that's when we see uh, that, that there is more um, maintenance and um, orderly conduct uh, being provided on these properties and has nothing to do with the owner occupied uh, occupancy. Good, Maureen, so permits are good. Permits are good, <laughs> although it keeps my life very busy. <laughs> I, I, I'm just circling back on this owner occupied in the master plan. And, and the, the only thing that I saw was that the master plan asked that we make it easier uh, for owner occupied you know, uh, properties to expand in, and add, you know, this kind of loops into the next item with the accessory dwelling units. But so are we making it easier? Um, I guess is a question we need to keep in the back of our minds uh, with this footnote M uh, discussion, because that speaks to the master plan, unless I'm missing something. Janet? So, um, so anyway, we do need to look at the impact of undergraduates on neighborhoods. And that's part of the owner occupancy thing discussion, for sure, because um, we are a town with 70% of our population, our students, and um, I'm sure people in the RG and the RN and everywhere can talk about how that can work for them or not work for them, depending on who's living next door. So um, Maureen, I was, I was hoping, I, I, know this, I know this is a hard ask, but did you say you could do sort of a build out of a neighborhood, like a 3D build out, like, you know, um, I mean, not not the entire town, although I think there actually is a build out of Amherst um, that I saw at a thing at UMass. They did a presentation like a year or two ago, but that would be useful. And um, and I would I would max the, the lot or building coverage, because if you're going to, you know, build six units or if nine units on a, you know, three quarters of an acre, an acre, you're probably going to want to fill up as much as you can and get your stuff as big as you can. So is that is that something you could show? in a 3D format or? I even... could show that for a few parcels, but. Um, Maybe next to each other or something. You know, yeah, that some, of... yeah, I could do a couple parcels. Uh, when you get into discussions of like, how about the whole neighborhood or yeah. uh, that, that would be um, very um, time consuming. Yeah. I and when I say time consuming, like weeks or I know. <laughs> months. So, so I, I, at UMass, I was at a conference and they did have a build out of Amherst. Like, you know, it was pretty remarkable and, you know, under their current zoning. So the other thing I, I did recently is I drove around the RG and parts of, you know, like I think sometimes dipping into RN and I was looking at different townhouses and apartments and infill and and things and some places were really pleasant and some places were really kind of unattractive. And so I could send that list around to the planning board if people want to um, in their COVID times a little extra time for that. And then also, I think, you know, I, I think there's all of these changes that we're looking at, there's time to mull them, but I do think we need to get the impact of the community and neighborhood and who is being affected and figure out a mechanism for that, so. Okay, well, I see no more hands. And again, we're getting, uh, we're an hour and a half in, uh, and we're gonna talk about footnote M again uh, with, with some, uh, with help from Maureen. So I suggest like we wrap uh, this up and if there's any, you know, objection to that or anybody has, you know, one, you know, something more they want to say on Phenom, uh, but then I can open up to, to public comment. I see one hand up in the attendees. So any other planning board members have comments on this? Good, see none. All right, so uh, we'll move it to public comment and we're, again, this, you know, we definitely want to keep, you know, to three minutes. Uh, and who do we have here, Pam? So we have Pam Rooney first, followed okay. by Dorothy, 
and Hilda and Susanna. Sounds good. So we got who first? Pam Rooney. Hi, okay. Hi Pam Rooney. Can you unmute yourself? I can. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I heard a, I heard a couple people mention that again that net the net between what is currently on a property and what its total capacity might be, and I totally appreciate that. That could be a lot of work. Now maybe that's something that that a a, a horde of volunteers could walk around the RG and try to take notes on how many units it appears are in each of these buildings, but I think it's it does give us a little bit, or, a little bit better sense of um, what additional growth actually, you know, might look like. Um, just in looking at uh, a quick question for Maureen on her sheet eight, um, there the title is net change of units allowed by lot size with footnote M removed, but in the legend it's number of units allowed per lot with footnote M. And so I was sitting there looking, I, I picked one example. This is the um, North Pleasant Street UMass property that you pointed out, I think Maureen, in your conversation, which shows an 11 and is a bright orange. And if I were to read the 11, that to me says that it really should be green. And so I'm not sure if I should read it as 16 or 17, or if I should read the number and and think of it as green. So that's just a question. I don't know if I'm confused or the map is confused. Probably me. Um, when I think about the the conversation that you had about footnote M applying to things over over one acre, um, I did some quick math on page. Um, I think it was page nine, and the numbers of parcels under one acre are almost 300. So we're talking about 40 or 50 parcels that are greater than one acre. Um, I think it's 46. Pardon? I, said I think it's 50. 46. I said, I said approximately 50. And under mm -hmm. under one acre is approximately 300. Um, and so if 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 it were up to me, I think I would. I think we're we're going to be talking, or you are going to be talking about uh, access uh, accessory dwelling units. And my gut feeling is that with 300 parcels that have some capacity, perhaps for accessory dwelling units that we're really, um, we really are covering that base of providing and allowing for infill should people choose to do that on their properties. Thank you, on Pam. The, on the, just that, like on the acres above, uh, are the parcels above one acre, I would like to see footnote M retained and, main, and kept in place. I think there are not many people in the RG neighborhood who really do want to see a nine unit or a 12 unit apartment building being built next to them. Thank you, Pam. Except, except along perhaps the corridors that Doug and Maria's maps showed a couple of weeks ago. Thank you. And we have uh, Dorothy, Pam. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dorothy. Could you unmute yourself, please? Did that work yet? Hi. Okay. Yes, we hear you. Good. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. Um, in terms of discussing um, owner occupancy and problem um, apartments, we've had several presentations in uh, Precinct 10 um, with John Thompson from Enforcement, and um, we have had different information. Uh, Rolf Kallstrom did a study of apartments in the RG, which is uh, between Amity and the university. And um, the problem houses were the ones that were non-owner occupied with one exception, the owners were away on a sabbatical. Every, every house that was not owner occupied, whether it had a resident manager or not, were the ones that had two things, um, where police were called there often, student problems, and also deterioration of property. 
Um, and you can just tell by walking up, you know, if you're delivering a flyer, walking up the stairs, you know whether you're entering a, a, an owner-occupied property or not. So those are, but that's why the rental, rental registration program was set up. And that has allowed uh, if a, uh, the inspectors to get in and to say, okay, you self-certified yourself as having these things. Now let's see how they go. So um, that rental registration program helps stop this massive buying of private homes and turning them into, um, you know, small mini student dorms. Uh, it's, it's still going on, but it has slowed it greatly. Um, the other question, I had a problem with chart seven or eight, um, looking at, and I do love being able to see the individual lots. And so I look at my lot and I know from your blue and white chart from last week that right now I could have three um, accessory units of some sort, but that, that, that without footnote M, I could have nine because I'm on 0 .70, it's 0 0.73 acre. And you noticed that on your chart, you said that that level, three quarters of an acre was in fact the mean of properties um, in the RG, the historic district. So I was confused by that because the number that you had written on it was still three, um, which is not, you know, is not that disturbing. But my, my big question is, I thought that the impetus was more affordable housing that by increasing the number of housing units, somehow we would bring down the cost and we'd be able to have workforce housing. People who work in this town could afford to do it. We could have more families coming in. But I don't see that with removing footnote M. I see um, it really making it um, very attractive to developers um, to come in with, it takes a lot of money to build these additional units, to come, to come in and to build more things and recent comments have been made about, did rents go down with the new apartments? And the answer that I've heard was no, the rents are high in the new apartments and it kind of set the tone and maybe have increased rents in the RG. So I see a lot of difficulties with this footnote M. Um, and I, I think um, keeping it in for properties above an acre is good, but I think, um, the exponential nature that you were showing in your your bar chart which is really really interesting um it starts a little bit lower than that um going from three units to, to nine un extra units on a three quarters of an acre um is a pretty big increase so thank you Pam. we'll look at that some more thank you thank you uh hey, Hilda. Hilda. i have a series of things that I picked up that I, first of all, when they were talking about rezoning North Amherst about five years ago, I did a cross correlation with the 2010 census with the street list and got a big blow up of Xerox, the huge enlargement of the, of the area on the map and colored it and I did not have the software. It took me days to do this, but I filled in every single loss north of Hobart Lane to see what the proportion of rental housing to home ownership. At that point, which as I say, I think was about five years ago, we were 12% owner occupied housing in North Amherst, north of Hobart Lane. And that's one reason that I've sort of been pushing for more owner occupied because in, you know, we have very low voting turnout in precinct one up here for the most part, unless there's a presidential election. So owner occupied and workforce housing will bring stability to the town and allow people to develop equity. But basically the reason I brought up on making the map is that I'm willing to do that again when the 2020 census comes out, if people will help me with it or if there is software. But, but I learned a lot with the map and just to be able to see the rentals and then the, we're all in black and the couple owner occupies were in red. And then I had the duplexes in there and the apartments a different color. And I still have that map in my closet. I don't think I threw it out. So that was one thing that I wanted to say that that census, whenever it comes out, has incredible amount of information in it that may not necessarily be in, in the file of permits. Uh, so, 
The other, other two things I wanted to bring up was, now might be a good time because Maureen did put her finger on it, the size of the units. Now is a good time, and I've been plugging this one for 25 years, is that the impact of a studio apartment of a one bedroom is not the same or even four studio apartments or four one bedrooms is not the same as one four bedroom house. Okay. And especially downtown, you don't need to have eight cars with four studios. Um, this may be a real good time when you're considering footnote in and figuring out about infill is to maybe getting rid of the dwelling units as a as a datum and, and look at the number of bedrooms or the number of possible people. And, and I'm thinking sort of in terms, you can look at the parcel that you have and what would be the maximum footprint that could go there and how it would look. Hilda, and you, then you, let people you're... determine how many dwelling units would go in it by, by what building you could put there. And Hilda, that you're... way you may get more smaller units for, for, are uh, you, please don't interrupt me. Well, you're, you're you at three get... minutes is all. Oh, well, I have one more comment to make. Okay. And that's the fact, and this is because I've used it myself, that most of the older houses that were built pre-zoning by law, pre-1925, um, are non-conforming in the RG. And 9.22 was used a lot, and especially in the area of the house I'm thinking about, is 738 Main Street, which is 7,500 square um, I think 7,500 square feet, it might be that small. And like 60 feet of frontage, it was a parsonage for the second church. And we, we were able to apply 9.22 because most of the buildings within at least five or 100 feet or a thousand around it were all multifamily housing. So when you think about these units on the size of the lots downtown, you got to think of how many people are going to go in and say that it's not substantially different from what's there. And it's not going to be detri more detrimental to the neighborhood if, if you've got a six bedroom house with two three bedroom units in it or a six bedroom house with however many people are living in it without a permit. So, I mean, you've got to think of the, the, the how many people of those lots that are under an acre are going to come in and say, I want to apply 9.22 because it's not substantially more detrimental. That, those are my points. Great. Thank you. Uh, Susanna? Hi, Susanna. Hi there. Um, this is maybe Hilda just answered my question, but I'm not sure because I don't know what 9.22 is. Um, if your lot is non-conforming because it doesn't have enough frontage, do these do all of these uh, calculations about how much could be added if footnote M was removed? Do they apply to that or not? Someone want to answer that? Chris, or? I'd say it's a case by case basis. We'd have to look at why it's not conforming and whether, and whether that would be applicable to what um, the person who was applying for something wanted to do. So you can't really make a blanket statement about it. Okay. I was just going to suggest that if they don't apply that those properties be eliminated from your analysis. But if, if it's case by case, I guess you can't do that. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, and Ken Rosenthal, please. Hi, Ken. Hello, I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue. There's always a tension between housing for students and workforce housing for year-round residents who will be in Amherst and contributing to the economy of Amherst. Uh, one additional way we might think about this is for subsequent units to be built with or without footnotes note M is to change the definition of family in those subsequent units to be no more than three unrelated individuals rather than four. That would encourage those units to be for 
a smaller groups with fewer cars or perhaps make it easier for small families or a, a young couples with no children to move into those units and help to serve the workforce in the community a little better. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Great. Okay. So I think that uh, wraps up any other comments from uh, planning board or, or the planning staff on this item, which we're going to talk about next week again. Good. Okay. So we will move on to uh, item 3B, discussion about expanding size of supplemental dwelling units from 800 square feet, um, which, would, which is 900 square feet if it's fully ADA accessible to 1,000 square feet including potential changes uh, to the permitting process. And we have a presentation from the planning staff. We have Ben Breger, who's a planner in the planning department, who's going to present um, information about the supplemental dwelling units and the potential increase in size. Great, Great. thank you, Chris, and thanks, Jack, and thank you to the planning Hi, board. Hello, everybody. Um, Hi. So let's see here, I can share my screen. I have the PowerPoint up. All right, um, let's see here. So yeah, I'm gonna talk, be talking about the our proposal for adjusting the ADU bylaw. That's the um, accessory dwelling unit or supplementary dwelling unit. Um, this was a recommendation from the CRC, I guess a directive to the planning department to put together a proposal for um, supplementary dwelling units. Um, and I guess uh, backing up a little bit, I uh, just want everyone to kind of uh, transition from footnote M, which was focusing on the, just the RG and really focusing on townhouses and apartments, whereas uh, supplemental dwelling units are, this is a proposal town-wide and it's really for the provision of one uh, accessory dwelling unit for, on only lots that have a single family dwelling. So we're looking at single family lots and adding an additional dwelling unit to that lot. And this is town wide. Um, and so uh, looking at the clock now, I mean, it's 8.30. I had a long, pretty long, a fairly long presentation planned. I can go quickly through it um, just for the sake of time. Uh, there's some so background. Get it right, Ben. You know, take your time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, yeah, let me, I'm just going to start with a little bit of background information just to make sure everyone's on the same page about what we're talking about here. So, accessory dwelling units. Um, and I will say, too, as a uh, just so everyone knows, I'm using accessory dwelling units and supplementary dwelling units pretty interchangeably. Um, our bylaw says supplemental dwelling units pretty much. Every other bylaw I've seen says accessory dwelling units. Um, and that's actually a change I'm propose we're proposing to make is just changing the language and terminology a little bit. But um, when I say accessory dwelling units, I'm referring to the supplementary dwelling units in our bylaw. So, um, so accessory dwelling units are small dwelling units or apartments that exist on the same property lot as a single family resident. Um, they're a fully contained living space with a kitchen, bath and sleeping area. And they're often, you know, three categories. They can be fully located within the primary structure. They can be attached to the primary structure or detached from the primary structure. Um, these are very common and they're often referred to by many names throughout the years. Carriage house, a back house, a backyard bungalow, um, granny flat, in-law suite, guest house. So lots of different names to all refer to the same idea. Um, so ADUs, accessory dwelling units, um, ADUs are an important piece to the housing, helping alleviate the housing crisis. They help with housing affordability in a lot of ways uh, as they can generate rental income to help own homeowners cover mortgage payments. Um, ADUs are less expensive to construct because the land is already owned by the owner of the primary structure. So you're really just paying for construction costs. Um, furthermore, this is a way to provide small scale housing in majority single family neighborhoods. And it's a way to do that as an infill um, into an existing neighborhood fabric. And furthermore, um, it's this kind of sweet spot where it's not as small as an apartment, but it's not a large home. It's kind of the size of a 
a small it's a small small dwelling unit and it's important uh, middle housing between the apartment and the large home. ADUs also help with uh, multi-generational housing and add to kind of housing flexibility. Um, there's a lot of different ways ADUs and a single family home can work together um, intergenerationally. So ADUs offer young families entry level housing choices. ADUs enable families to expand beyond their primary home uh, for empty nesters that are looking to downsize but don't necessarily want to leave town or leave their neighborhood they can downsize into the smaller accessory dwelling unit and then rent out their larger home or vice versa you know adus you can have your your grandparents or your parents um, live in the backyard in the in the backyard bungalow and be there to help with the uh, with raising the family and taking care of the children so it, they really offer a lot of flexibility and opportunities to um, just make it easier for families to live together and for generation of rental income. Furthermore, um, they have a lot of environmental benefits and sustainable development principles. Um, they're a way to, you know, include smaller, relatively affordable homes in established neighborhoods with minimal visual impact and without adding to sprawl. They require fewer re resources to build and maintain. And then furthermore, for um, ADUs that are, especially the ones that are fully contained within a primary structure, it's less energy to heat and cool them. Um, so where do, you know, this isn't, this isn't a, a new concept at all, these accessory dwelling units. It's been a long standing, you know, idea and development. Um, you know, in the pre-zoning in this country, people often built as many homes as they wished on their property. It wasn't, they weren't only allowed to build one home, you know, moving into the early 19th or 20th century, you know, larger homes often had a lot of associated outbuildings such as barns and carriage and carriage houses. Um, many of these carriage houses have subsequently been converted into rental homes. Likewise, you know, car garages were built uh, with housing units on top or, or subsequently have been converted into housing. Um, but with the onset, you know, the post-World War II superb suburban development um, boom, you know, uh, lots were off, you know, with the onset of zoning, it was often very, uh, ADUs were often highly regulated and, and in a lot of cases made illegal because it was a simple like one home per lot regulation. However, um, in the last, you know, 20 years, um, ADUs have really, come on the scene again, uh, AARP and the American Planning Association have taken a lead on advocacy in this regard and releasing a lot of resources for states and local um, governments to update their codes. Um, you know, uh, some states, California and New Hampshire are pretty much requiring all cities and towns to allow ADUs completely by right, uh, Oregon as well. In Massachusetts, um, I'd say we're a little bit behind the rest of the country. Um, however, the Massachusetts Housing Act that was just passed, geez, I think with, within the last month, um, has some language in there regarding accessory dwelling units. Um, in the Boston area, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag uh, of towns, of the 100 towns in the metropolitan Boston area. Um, you know, 37 allow accessory dwelling units, you know, and 32 have no accessory uh, dwelling unit zoning at all. Um, and the towns that do have ADUs, they often have a lot of uh, zoning and dimensional regulations, permitting requirements that restrict this, uh, their build out. And there was a stat in this uh, uh, report by the Pioneer Institute that it's really, you know, it's 2.5 permits annually per town. So it's a really not adding a lot at all to the housing in the Boston area. Um, looking at this area in particular, um, I looked at comparing bylaws for ADUs for towns, um, cities and towns in Western Mass, Amherst, Northampton, East Hampton, Greenfield, Montague, and then just two uh, in Eastern Mass, Lexington and Somerville. Um, what I found was 
uh, you know, Amherst is kind of in the ballpark with a lot of these other cities and towns um, in terms of the types that we allow, the permitting requirements, um, special permits for most types of ADUs, square footage requirements. This is one area where Amherst was, we had a, a smaller square footage maximum than most others. Uh, we, we do allow 900 right now for ADA accessible units, um, but often 900 or 1,000 is seen. And I will say, you know, just a quick Google search of what other mass towns are doing right now. Like I came up with a lot of cities that are reviewing their ADU bylaws, you know, now or have in the past year, Barnstable, Salem, Newton are all kind of looking at the, this issue right now. Um, a lot of, of most bylaws have design requirements for the accessory dwelling unit as well. And I'll get to that. Um, so now I'm going to focus in on Amherst and the accessory dwelling units, the history of ADUs here and kind of what we're proposing. Um, so I found that in, uh, in 1968 is when the AD, uh, supplemental dwelling unit first appeared in Amherst zoning bylaw. And at that time, um, it was only allowed in the residential outlying district and only for fully contained uh, supplemental apartments. Um, uh, between 1968 and 2014, this was amended multiple times and it was eventually expanded to all residential zoning districts, excluding the RF district. Um, and then in 2014 is how, when we amended, uh, up, updated the bylaw to get to where we are now. Um, we added these new categories, Supplemental Apartment 1, sup Supplemental Apartment 2, and Supplemental Detached, added these, uh, added the requirements that they had to be on, one, one unit had to be on your occupied. Uh, there's no additional lot area required, no more than three adults in the accessory dwelling unit. Um, they can't be used for lodging. And then we also added the dimensional regulations. Uh, the planning board endorsed this change seven to zero and it passed town meeting. And then subsequently in 2018, uh, there was a proposal to increase the maximum square footage allowed only for detached dwelling uh, units to 1000 square feet or 1100 for ADA accessible units. Um, the supplemental one and two they would remain at 800 square feet. Um, this change, uh, this proposal had unanimous support from the planning board and was viewed as a way to allow a wider variety of living arrangements, such as two or th three bedroom units, which normally might not be possible in an 800 square foot unit um, and would add, uh, house, add to the housing stock, especially for family, families looking for rental units in neighborhood settings. Um, the amendment received a majority of town meeting support, but not the two thirds that was required to pass. And my understanding, it was uh, town meeting kind of thought that this was after the charter was passed and they felt like town council should be the ones to um, make this change. And um, just briefly, ADUs are, you know, referenced in the Amherst in various plans that speak to this proposal. Um, the Amherst master plan talks about making it easier to create attached and detached accessory apartments. The Amherst housing production plan talks about possible buy right provisions for supplemental dwelling units, adding design guidelines and reducing parking requirements. And then finally, the Amherst housing market study uh, recommends to allow supplemental apartments by right in all residential zoning districts as a way to meet the housing demands in Amherst. Um, just briefly, this is what we uh, pulled up for the number of units, uh, number of accessory units permitted in Amherst over the past uh, five years, 2015 to 2019. Um, you know, the 2019 numbers, they maybe didn't we made this in February of 2020, um, so about a year ago. So it may be that the 2019 numbers hadn't been counted yet for whatever reason, but you know, it's on average three to five accessory units permitted in Amherst per year. 
So um, if you're like me, you are confused. I, I was confused when I first started looking at this about the difference between ADUs, duplexes, and converted dwellings, all which are included in the Amherst bylaw. So I just wanted to quickly clear up any confusion um, and about different, uh, how they're related and how they're similar and different. Um, ADUs don't require additional lot area for the single unit, whereas for a duplex or converted dwelling, you, you need an additional lot area for that added unit. However, ADUs are capped. Um, our proposal is to cap them at 1,000 square feet. Currently, they're capped at 800 square feet, whereas for a duplex or converted dwelling, there's no cap on the um, square footage. However, you know, you have to meet uh, building coverage, lot coverage, setbacks, all that. And that, that goes with ADUs as well. Um, so for ADU, you're it's, there is an owner occupancy requirement for one of the units, either the primary dwelling or the ADU itself. However, it's not required for a duplex. It's required for a converted dwelling or you can have a resident manager on site. And for an occupancy limit, ADUs are uh, limited to three adults, whereas duplexes and converting dwelling Dwellings are uh, limited to four unrelated. Um, as you'll see in our proposed bylaw change, we're proposing to change the ADU to three unrelated individuals as opposed to three adults. And we'll talk about that later. Um, and now I'm just gonna quickly bring us around town to show us some of the ADUs that have been permitted in Amherst over the past, I guess, 12 years at this point. Um, I can go kind of quickly through this, but this one is on Page Street uh, as a 724 square foot uh, converted garage. That's two stories, uh, one bedroom, I believe. This one is on Beston Street. You can see the uh, ADU at the end of the garage. It's a studio and is 422 square feet. This is a 900 square foot um, ADA accessible a uh, detached dwelling unit on uh, Logtown Road. Um, so th those three were all detached. Um, the next one here is an attached uh, accessory dwelling unit. Um, so it'd be a supplemental two. It's 425 square feet. Um, and you can see this is the old, an old image of the house and then the proposed rendering. And I believe this was built um, so they basically added an addition and bumped out their garage um, and added a 425 foot square foot studio. And then just to show you that you can add a supplemental apartment that's fully contained and you, you might not even see it at all from the, uh, from the street. You know, th there's a 560 square foot one bedroom apartment in the basement of this house and you wouldn't really even know it at all looking at it from the outside. Um, this is on Wildwood Lane. And then um, also the, the grist mill in South Amherst on, on Mill Lane, I found out that had a fully contained one bedroom supplemental apartment um, attached to it as well. So you can, add, you can add these things and they don't really change the character of the neighborhood and they don't add much visual clutter, um, especially for the <clears throat> fully contained or attached units. Um, so now I'm going to just jump to our proposal. So um, we were tasked with looking at the 2018 proposal that failed that town meeting and looking at kind of reviving that. Um, and then the more we looked at that, uh, we subsequently made other changes to the bylaw to um, allow to basically reduce the barriers to ADU development. And so um, I will go over those now. Um, the 2018 bylaw proposal, all that did was changing the maximum square footage allowed uh, to uh, 1,000 square feet. And so what we did is uh, we're building on that bylaw proposal. Um, so this bylaw update proposes to increase the maximum square footage of ADUs, create a more streamlined permitting pathway and add additional design guidelines. So what we're proposing is to increase the maximum square footage for ADUs uh, to 1,000 square feet for all three types. And that provides an opportunity 
per ADUs with more than one bedroom. Uh, we propose to streamline the permitting pathway to reduce barriers to ADU development and reducing costs, especially costs associated with going through the permitting. Um, we add design guidelines to ensure that ADUs are compatible with the scale and the character of the primary structure and the surrounding neighborhood. And then lastly, um, simply uh, simplifying the bylaw structure to make it easier to interpret as well. So now I'm gonna go through the specific changes. Um, so like I said, <laughs> changing from the terminology, changing the terminology from supplemental to accessory uh, becomes consistent, making it consistent with federal, state, and industry terminology. You know, even as I was uh, going through town by town, looking at their bylaw, I would just do control F and go for, look for accessory dwelling unit. And if I didn't see it, then I assume they didn't have anything in their bylaw. And I imagine there's develop or homeowners that come into Amherst and quickly want to see, oh, can I build an accessory dwelling unit in Amherst? And if they see, they might look through our bylaw and, and not see those that word there. And so I think replacing supplemental with accessory uh, could make that just a simpler um, way to search the bylaw. Um, secondly, uh, we have kind of a confusing terminology in addition to the supplemental and accessory issue we have supplemental apartment one and two and then detached supplemental dwelling unit and so what i'm proposing is to just have three discrete types of adus contained adu attached adu and detached adu to simplify the bylaw even more um, thirdly uh, we're proposing to increase the maximum square footage for all three types of accessory dwelling units to 1,000 square feet and also to eliminate the minimum square footage. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about the first one. Uh, increasing one to 1,000 square feet, like we mentioned, allows for the development of not only, you know, a sizable one bedroom dwelling unit, but also two and maybe even three bedroom units. Um, and that's in line with a lot of what, what other states and towns are doing across the country. Um, and we also felt that eliminating the minimum square footage, which is at 350 right now, um, allows for the development of very of small dwelling units um, that you know sometimes you need to fit a fit something within a, a building or attached to a building in a garage that might not be um, it might be less than 350 square feet. So we felt there's no really no reason to limit um, the smaller size units. Um, and I will say there are building code and health codes that, you know, stipulate the smallest a, a unit could be um, based on like livable area and, you know, amount of space for a bedroom. So it's not like, you know, they can build, uh, you know, there, there are still limits that come into play with building codes. Um, so I will go to the fourth bullet point now. Um, we're proposing to kind of adjust the definition of the supplemental two, which is kind of analogous to the attached ADU. Um, right now, the way supplemental two is written is that it's it's limited to a 10% increase of a prime of the primary structure square footage. So that means you could, you could really, if you had a thousand square foot house, you could really only bump it out a hundred square feet um, to meet this requirement. And so if we're allowing for larger uh, attached dwelling units, then we thought, you know, there's no reason to limit the size of the attached dwelling unit relative to the primary structure. It's, it's simpler just to say that the, the attached dwelling unit needs to be attached to the primary structure. Um, you know, cause from the exterior, if you have a, you know, for example, if you have a, a very small house say 800 square feet and it's a single family home, you could add you know, a 2000 square foot addition to that house, you could add, a, sorry, you could add a 1000 square foot addition to that house, um, you know, and call, you know, uh, and it wouldn't trigger any, it would trigger, you need a building permit, but it wouldn't need any review. And so, um, 
whether or not it has a dwelling unit in it, uh, it's um, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's a 10% increase, I guess, from the from the primary structure. Um, and so we just thought it was simpler to say that. And it's, again, still limited to 1,000 square foot maximum. Um, so for permitting pathway, we're proposing to um, make attached and contained accessory dwelling units allowed by right. Whoops. Attached and contained accessory dwelling units allowed by right. And those would still come with uh, a host of requirements that I'll get to. Um, and if they don't meet those requirements, then um, they would be subject to review by special permit and could be denied as well. So um, we felt that you know reducing these barriers to permitting could uh, promote this type of development in our in our neighborhoods. Um, Finally, we propose to allow detached accessory dwelling units by right with those requirements. Um, if it's a less, if it's less than 50% of the primary structure's habitable space. And so, for example, if it's a, uh, let's see, 1800 square foot home, um, they could add a 900 square foot ADU by right. But if they wanted to go above 900, between 900 and 1,000, then they would need to get a special permit from the ZBA. And that's a way of kind of controlling the scale of the uh, detached dwelling units to make it so we can add, we can enforce the, these design guidelines and make sure that the detached dwelling units in scale with the uh, primary structure as well. And then furthermore, we add these design guidelines requiring that the architecture and the scale of the accessory dwelling unit is compatible with and secondary to the primary structure. So I know that was a lot. Um, those are all the changes that we're proposing. I have the Word document as well that kind of shows the line by line uh, things crossed out and things added. And I know that's probably an easier way to show it. Um, I have this table that I included that kind of shows in gray the existing bylaw and in black the 2021 proposal that we're talking about today, um, showing the you know new names for these things, the square, square footage regulations. Right now, we're proposing to have them all capped at a thousand with no minimum, um, and then contained and attached by right with with the requirements and then detached by right if less than 50% of the primary dwelling and special permit if more than 50%. So the uh, habitable space has come up a lot. That's how we're determining uh, the square footage. So a thousand square foot max of habitable space. And also the um, it, it would have to be 50% of the primary structures habitable space. We didn't just come up with that term. It's a defined term in our bylaw and is one that's used throughout it. So just to remind people, it's the gross square footage of pretty much the living, sleeping, cooking, or eating uh, of space with those purposes. Um, so it excludes, uh, uh, what does it exclude? Kind of everything that's not these areas. Um, so that's, it, it's 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 different than square footage, um, and it's a way of capturing the space that's actually used for living. I, I guess it doesn't include garages, for example, or unfinished basements. Um, and then moving through this, I guess I just wanted to show the kind of some examples of what these could look like in different neighborhoods. Um, and again, so this is in Lincoln Avenue, um, a house that has you know, the square footage is written here, 1500 or 1850. However, these are, you know, two or three story buildings. So they have 2,280 square foot of liv livable area. And so these, how, these uh, units, these properties, they could build a 1000 square foot ADU, detached ADU in their backyard um, by right is what we're proposing. Here we, this is in Orchard Valley, another neighborhood where it's all single family homes, often on lots that extend quite far back. Um, so there are rooms in the backyard for accessory dwelling units. 
this house has 1200 square foot of livable area. So they could build, you know, a 625 square foot um, accessory dwelling unit by right. And if they wanted to go up to a thousand, um, we're proposing that would be a by special permit. And then here's in Echo Hill North, kind of same same concept. You know, they, these the, these folks could build a 900 square foot AD, detached ADU by uh, we're proposing by right. If they wanted to go to 1,000, it would be by special permit. Over here, they have way a much more livable area, so they could go up to the 1,000 square foot limit if they wanted. Um, by right is what we're proposing. So those are a few examples um, and I'll almost at the end here. Um, you know, we'll, I assume we'll post this PowerPoint online. Here's a host of resources all about accessory dwelling units. If you're curious about what's going on nationally or in the state, um, you can click these links for more information. Um, and with that, I conclude and I just want to thank you all and welcome your questions or feedback. So Thank you for bearing with me through that long presentation. Appreciate it. Ben, that was very good. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and we can open it up for discussion. Uh, Maria. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, I was part of that whole 2018 start. Uh, and so is Jack, I think. I think we might be the only two who are part of the um, original dwelling unit um increase to the to town meeting and um i think adding the buy right is a great thing to add because it unlocks it and then when you added that provision of that up to 50 percent it's still buy right that's a good protection layer because i think we sort of thought through like what if you have a small 800 square foot house and then you put a thousand square foot supplemental dwelling unit that doesn't make sense so i think all the little tweaks you made um make a lot of sense and um i hope this moves forward because it was already close but now you've improved it even more so um yeah thank you so much for the presentation and um that's it <laughs> thanks maria uh doug yeah um I, I had sent some questions to chris uh a couple of days ago and i'm we don't need to go through them now but I'm just hoping Ben and Chris can send me replies to that to that email. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good, Janet. Doug, I'm interested in your questions. I have a couple of questions myself. Um, one of the questions was, um, so if if this is by right, does that go to the building to the building commissioner, or is it going to come to the planning board? I mean, they, are they, is it just, you know, they're just looking for a building permit or? In this case, that's what we're proposing. Okay, that, I thought so. Um, I just pictured a lot of planning board hearings and that makes me feel better. Um, and then I'm, I have some concerns about the, I'm getting rid of the minimum of 350 square feet. Um, I'm channeling my grandmother who grew up in a tenement on the Lower East Side and I'm picturing three people living in a very small house and so, um, or, you know, or a family, you know, if they're related people. And I just wondered, it just seems like, you know, how small can it go um, under like state codes and things like that. So I have a concern that going below 350, it might just become inhabitable for large groups of people. And we're back to a situation where led to zoning, probably, you know, <laughs> right? Um, so is there a minimum size for a unit under state law that That is somewhere in the building code, I'm, and I'm not sure offhand. Um, I thought 350 was it? Maybe it's 300. So th I'd love to get the it's, answer. To that. It's whatever it is. It's less than 350 because our uh, there's been cases where that minimum comes into play and people mm -hmm. are stuck. Isn't it the health code that that has a minimum on the size of habitable bedrooms think, and such? I think it is the health code, and I think Rob Moore quoted to us something like you could have a dwelling unit that was like 150 square feet. So he's he's here if he um, is interested in answering that question. Okay. Rob. Oh, he's got his hand up. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I did have my hand up. Oh, Thanks. there he is. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the building code does allow a dwelling unit to get pretty small. It can be down to about 180 square feet. 
Uh, we've worked that through multiple times with the idea of a tiny home. Uh, you know, so, you know, there are, it gets complicated because, you know, each space in a dwelling unit has a minimum square footage, but that's what it amounts to. Now, the, the sanitary, the state sanitary code that our health in, uh, inspectors enforce has a little different standard, and that, that's based more on the occupancy. So, you know, that starts at 150 square feet and then goes up 100 square feet for every occupant. Um, and, you know, that might have been years ago where maybe the 350 was generated from. But um, we thought it was a good idea to, to think about eliminating the lower threshold because in every other use group, you know, um, that we typically deal with these types of permits like converted dwellings, the, the smaller size unit, the minimum is there at 350. So this would be something different that, that could be offered in a buy right use. Um, and we know units can be that small and, and be successful. I mean, I, I think we know uh, Spring Street is permitted with units that are you know about 240 to 260 square feet on the smaller side. Uh, so it is something that you know could be done to create a, a, a usable, dwell, a livable dwelling unit. Okay, that, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, the other question I had was, I, I, I can look at my window and I can see three houses that are 1,000 square feet. And I, there's like that, that's probably the predominant square footage of my neighborhood. And so, so if they wanted to build a house that was more than 500 square feet, they would have to get a special permit. Would, would you probably, would they probably be building like a two story cottage? I mean, it seems sort of strange to have like two ranch houses on the lot. Like, what is it that you would expect them to do differently or why do you want to do that extra protection and scrutiny who wants to take that rob or chris or ben sure um well i'll give it a shot and ben can add to it but you know i think what we're envisioning is you know a situation that we can't account for a sloping lot that maybe you know, there's a, a an expansion of a footprint, but the square footage gets bigger because a lower level gets used or is incorporated into that. Uh, we know we've seen examples of uh, spaces over garages uh, that can that can be part of a uh, improvement to a property that includes something both for the the primary residence and for uh, creating an accessible or accessory dwelling unit. So I think we're just trying not to limit or um, totally lock out the potential for something to be expanded if it's appropriately done to a design standard, uh, you know, to, to limit that possibility and let the Zoning Board of Appeals through the special permit process uh, find that it's, uh, you know, suitable for its location and, and the building that it's being uh, associated with. So I, I was kind of going between thinking like two ranches on the same property would look weird. So maybe you would want to design it in a way that doesn't look so strange. And and then the other hand, I feel like if you have a thousand square foot house and you wanted to build a 750 square foot um, ADU, why would they have to go through more procedure than somebody with a larger home? Because that seems sort of unfair to me on the other side. So I, I was kind of, I'm, my thinking is kind of going between those two things. My um. My last question is what the phrase secondary to, to the primary structure, like what does that mean? Like um, so we, we were playing around with that for a little while. Um, the idea is that kind of gets to your point exactly that it, uh, the detached dwelling unit, you know, should look secondary or, you know, um, to the primary structure, I guess maybe maybe secondary is not the right word, but I guess it should be clearly like not the main house. It should be, um, you know, something that's. Uh, I don't want to say subordinate well, or just I, like I yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ancillary. Yeah, it's funny. It's a fact. ancillary. Yeah. Is it a legal term or is it just like a? I I just didn't get it in a way. So. I think it get, it gets to the scale and and it gets to the scale of the house, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and then my my comment is, I thought that I would tighten up the language about um, the design, maybe saying the same architectural style or match the appearance of the primary house. And and on the you know, so I felt like that would be make it kind of fit in more. And then I also wondered, thinking about Maria, like maybe you would want to have something that looks a little different. And so I, I just kind of tossing that back. That's just a comment. 
Thank you. Um, I believe Maria. Or, uh, I, I, yeah. I, I, oh, Maria, you had something. Okay. Sorry. No, I was going to mention tiny homes really quickly that, that those are a new type of home that's under 400 square feet. And there's an appendix Q bylaw specifically to that type of housing. And it's a new trend for people who don't want to build ADUs, but build really tiny homes. So I, I'm glad that minimums take it away. So that's it. Very good. Uh, Nate? Sure. Yeah, I think the, um, Dan, your questions are good. I, I think the difficulty with um, some of these is, you know, how do you regulate the design and do you really want to prescribe something that has to look like the existing single family home? You know, so when this was discussed previously um, by the local historic district commission and then the historical commission at one point for a property, you know, some of the members felt like, why, why wouldn't we want to promote contemporary design? Like what's wrong with, you know, a structure that has a different type of siding and roof line then you know why have it be a gable end you know greek revival style like why do we have to match that style for an accessory dwelling unit so i think that it's a really difficult thing to have you know some design guidelines that, and then you know the balance of being overly prescriptive so i understand right secondary to the main house you know may not really say anything um so then is it you know is it the massing is it the entryways is it the location on the lot? So for instance, someone could put an accessory dwelling unit on the front lawn, you know, and that's permissible. Uh, you know, they could put an addition on the house. So, you know, the, those a thousand square foot ranches you have, someone could buy it and tear the roof off, raise the roof, make it a whole, you know, second story house, and then also put a two car garage on. So they could, you know, almost triple the size of the footprint of the house without even doing anything other than a building permit. And, um, and there's not many design guidelines there. So I think with the accessory dwelling units, it's interesting, right? The balance of how much do you regulate the design and character? And then what do you allow for creativity of the, of the home, homeowner or developer? And so, you know, we've, at one point we were talking about doing some 3D mock-ups and it's really difficult because if we show something, um, a design, people might say, oh, that's what it'll look like, but it may not at all. I mean, it may look completely different. It could be a modular structure that's brought in, or it could be, you know, something different. So I think, you know, I think those are good questions is, you know, it's, it's, you know, how much do we want to regulate that or have some design guidelines? If not, if they're not standards, you know, or what, what do we have to help with, you know, staff make those decisions when there's an application? So hey, I, I have a, a general question. Say you want to convert your two car garage into this ADU, but then you want to, you still want a garage and you do uh you know an unattached you know structure out there for a garage is, is that would that be a, a by right situation yeah i'm, I'm seeing chris and rob nod their heads that, that's it yes <laughs> yes right. yeah i mean because you know you've, you've got all the water and sewer you know within the main home uh mm -hmm reasonable thing to do so yeah and again right. just to clarify you know we're still talking about meeting setback requirements building coverage lot coverage all all of that um is still mm -hmm. is still in play it's just i guess the only difference with an adu is that the additional lot area per unit does not come into play so by the way I, my computer must be really buggered up because i see nobody's pictures right now yeah <laughs> i see no i see no videos except myself <laughs> Sorry about that. So if people are nodding uh, and I don't see it, that's that's oh, why. Okay. And any other comments from the board? I see none. Uh, we can go, whoop, uh, Johanna. Johanna just popped up. Thanks, sorry. I've been quiet tonight, just kind of taking it all in, um, but I, I don't know, I'm really impressed with the work that the planning staff has done and I really appreciate all the presentations and the thoughtfulness that has gone into preparing these proposals. Absolutely. And uh, so I think we can open up to public comment on this. I see um, Dorothy Pam. Yep. Hi, Dorothy. Hey, I didn't do it yet. Oh. 
Hi, Hi, Dorothy. Hi, how are you? Very so, well. I, I, I love this little presentation and um, even the pictures on the front page with the orange part showing where the addition is, um, it just clarifies it so much. Um, what I like is this is family housing, it is workforce housing, it's affordable, uh, it has design guidelines and it's connected to owner occupied. So I see it as really being uh, very, very suitable to the RG. Um, I have a lot of grave doubts about removing footnote M, but I think this would be great. And I think giving the examples uh, was wonderful. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, especially where it you know, applies, it's, as Ben said, it's town-wide, uh, so. Uh, I'm going to allow Pam Rooney to speak next. Oh, okay, we have two more, yeah, I see. Hi, Pam. Hello, if to keep the Pams uh, differentiated here. <laughs> I know. Uh, nice presentation from Ben, thank you very much. Uh, the charts were really great in just um, the owner occupancy uh, differential between ADUs, duplexes, and converted dwellings. That's very handy. So those two tables went to the heart of some of the questions I bothered Chris Bressoff with earlier, uh, earlier this week. So thank you very much for those. Um, I support uh, accessory dwelling units in the many shapes and forms that are being suggested here. I think it's very much <clears throat> Very much New England tradition. I actually, I actually am more in favor of the attached and and what's the other one contained, uh, mm -hmm. simply because that is in fact more the the style than having a detached building. Again, it's greener. It's the the reduction of uh, perimeter in uh, envelope is makes sense. All of that, uh, and it's very easy to make the the add on look like the back room of an old farmhouse. So um, thanks for all the hard work on that. I'm sure there'll be some time to uh, go through the text and you know look for little odds and ends, but I think in general it seems really solid and should work very nicely in uh, every, every residential district except fraternity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hilda? Hi, Hilda. Hi. Um, all right. I'm going to put another bug in your ointment here. Um, it's coming again from my 60 years experience in this town. And that what's an owner? What is an owner? And apparently there's no site plan review involved here at all so there's no conditions on any kind of a permit it would be rob who would decide and so when i ask what is a young uh, an owner we have houses that are bought by daddy who lives in boston and mother who, who both maybe live somewhere else and have a kid that goes to umass who he and three friends live in the main house and they just bought this house and there's a thousand square foot outhouse in the backyard, which that's for a lot of kids in that thousand square foot. So is this kid considered that the house is owner occupied? How are you gonna define it and how are you gonna enforce it? And how are you gonna limit the not to become a, a student complex? with no, no parents or anybody around supervising whether the trash gets taken out. So I'm just raising that as an issue because as I say, I've been there, done that. Uh, ben or? Rob looks Mr. like Rob. he's stunned. <laughs> <laughs> we, we also just want to say I, the same, same thing can happen now um, you can have a house that's um, a single family house and a supplemental apartment, a detached apartment can be built in the backyard, whether it's a garage or whatever it is. 
And, um, you know, you could have that kind of situation now. So, you know, we kind of rely on rental registration and other things to control those um, situations and um, complaints from neighbors, et cetera. But maybe Rob has a better answer. Uh, not, not a better answer, but, um, you know, it is something that we have encountered. Uh, our bylaw does define an owner as uh, someone that establishes principal residence at the oh, property. Okay. That's uh, good. The principal residence is also defined uh, on how you achieve that. Uh, so I guess the, the scenario that we're seeing is that uh, uh, the, you know, in very few cases, but we have seen students be named owners of the property. Uh, so it isn't as simple as a, a parent buying a property, uh, which happens all the time, but that's not an owner occupied situation, but uh, where a student is, uh, you know, either a member of an LLC or an owner of the property, they could establish principal residence there and satisfy the owner occupancy requirement. And that has happened. Okay. Great. Um, on to Ira, please. Hello, Ira. Hi, how are you? Again, I'm Ira Brick, 255 Strong Street. Um, the idea of tiny houses and yards uh, strikes me as more feasible, as uh, Dorothy was saying, than removing footnote M. It seems more of a controlled and deliberate thing that an owner would want to do for the various situations within their family. Um, but also, if I was a homeowner that wanted to consider building a thousand foot building in my backyard, and even though I own the land, it's not cheap to build a building, I would still want to know the supply and demand situation. Um, is it going to be students that are mostly knocking on my doors? Is there enough housing now so that all of these little houses that it will fulfill, you know, the dream of lowering prices because there's such a glut? Um, somebody I know this morning that's been involved in town politics for many years was just describing that there actually might be a glut of student housing. If we permit something to happen to increase the supply like this and don't understand the demand, um, that's a disservice to every homeowner that's going to invest in one of these buildings. Um, so again, it needs to be studied. I commend um, the study, and Ben, I thought that was a really good job. So thank you so much. Very good, thank you. Uh, going back to the planning board, or Nate, you have your hand up? Sure, I think Ben mentioned it, and I just wanted to reiterate it, that these accessory dwelling units, you know, we, you know, we would call them lowercase a affordable, not capital A affordable, so they're not deed restricted. And they wouldn't you know, necessarily count on the town's subsidized housing inventory. So they wouldn't be affordable you know, as recognized by the state. It's just there's too much, uh, you know, too much work to do this for an accessory dwelling unit. So even the housing production plan you know, had said that these could be affordable because you know, by their size or what have you, they could be rented or purchased at a lower price. So there's nothing, I mean, you know, when Ira was talking, it just, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, and Pat Dorothy said that um, they'd be affordable and I think they could be, but you know, these aren't necessarily deed restricted units. And I think in most cases they never would be, you know, they would just be affordable possibly because of their smaller size, they would not be rented for as much or, you know, I just wanted to say that because it'd be very difficult to have these be a unit that's on the town subsidized housing inventory. It would, it would, um, you know, it, that there's a lot of work involved there and they're typically not that type of unit. So, um, you know, the land trust or there could be other mechanisms that could be used to keep them affordable. But in terms of the town, you know, the state rec recognition of them, that's unlikely. Thank you, Nate. Oh, okay, I, I see more. Uh, hands up from the attendees, Dorothy and, and Hilda. Is that just a quick follow up or? I don't know. I generated, I generated some comments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hi, Dorothy. 
Hi. Yes, I think that's it. I, I meant small a affordable, okay. but it, it made me think when the this was brought to the town council, was it there was a talk about more affordable housing. And I think most of us thought, oh, housing that doesn't cost so much so people can afford to either buy it or rent it. Um, I think I'd probably have to go back and look to see what that charge was because um, when you talk about affordable with the capital A, I, I know that, the, uh, for example, even the small number of units at 132 Northampton, they have to hire a company to do it. Uh, it's it's huge searches, all kinds of paperwork. And you're right, a homeowner is not going to do that for one or two accessory dwellings in the backyard. It was not really in a position to do that. So uh, there was, I, I thought the connection was, and I really have to double check it, that if there was an increase in the housing supply, that the cost would somehow go down, but not be capital A necessarily affordable. That is done in a more formal process. So that's, thank you for bringing up that um, possible confusion. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And Hilda has a, another comment. But... Hey, Hilda. Hi. I, I just was occurred to me listening to this because I keep thinking about owner occupied. Would it be possible down the line via other sections of the bylaw that th this accessory dwelling unit could be also on a park occupied as a co-op arrangement could there be like two or would that come under a duplex by law if somebody wanted to make two owner occupied units on the parcel is that is that going to be something that would, might be possible down the line like under 50 age 52 50 or something like that yeah i can't I can't see people. Um, Chris, Chris Brestrup has her okay. hand up. Um, I think the permitting might need to be changed, but um, my first initial reaction is that the zoning bylaw doesn't really deal with um, the, ownership. Types, the types of um, ownership like condominiums. We don't talk at all about condominiums. So if that's what you're referring to, it I'm seems like, you know, one of the other or condominium could be possible, um, but it would be a legal, um, a legal mechanism outside of zoning. And that, that would be my opinion. But would the zoning al al allow that to happen? If, if you've got an extra unit that that's non becomes non-conforming as a duplex? We'd probably need to ask our legal counsel about that, but it seems like it would be possible unless Rob has a different point of view. Yeah, there's nothing that prohibits the condominium or the form of ownership, as Chris said, isn't regulated by zoning. So there's nothing that would prohibit that from occurring even right now. Because that sounds like a good idea. Then you get two units without the added square footage required for a duplex. Two owner-occupied units. Thank you, Hilda. Very good. <clears throat> uh, Janet. So um, I was going to say, which seems strangely pertinent right now, is I went to a um, presentation by Chris Lee about backyard ADUs, and he did point out that you could have um, an ADU and then it, you could turn it into a condo. So you, you know the property would be owned in common and they could be the condo, you know, the ADU could be sold as a condo or the original house. And so, you know, there is a way to change the, you know, change that from owner occupied with the ADU to just two condos sharing the same property. Um, but that is something that just is not covered by our zoning. So. Yeah, I will say, I'll just jump in, you know, Habitat did that um, on the duplex on 235 East Pleasant Street. And they, they did that also further up on North Pleasant. And I think you know, it's like a convex, it can be difficult if there's common areas like the driveway, you know, if there's not, you know, if it's a shared driveway and shared, um, you know, storage areas for trash or other and recycling, then it can be difficult to, you know, come up with a condominium association just on two units. So, you know, 
Habitat's done it. They, you know, it is a lot of work. The town worked with them with the one on, um, you know, the Hawthorne property. And it is a lot of work for two, just for two units. And especially depending on how the property is configured, it, you know, it would be easier, right? If it's a detached structure, accessory dwelling. Um, but, you know, I do think that it's something that the zoning doesn't regulate and it, you know, I think legally it depends on, I think a number of thing, number of factors with the property owners and also the banks, uh, depending on how they would view it, you know, the, the mortgage holder on the property, but it is possible. Good, good. Um... Rob? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify uh, the, uh, an earlier comment that, you know, I, I was responding to what I thought Hilda was asking about a duplex example. Um, when we're talking about the accessory dwelling unit permitted under this section, even the way we're drafting it now, uh, when you create a condominium and put them both into private separate ownership, it's no longer an accessory situation. So you end up with two principal uh, dwelling units, essentially. So that would be something different. So I think we'd have to, um, to Janet's comment, if we wanted to um, embrace that uh, possibility, we want to build, we would have to build that into the uh, bylaw that doesn't, uh, uh, wouldn't permit that now because just the simple uh, relationship between principal and accessory use. Good. Okay. So I see no further hands up. So I'm wondering, you know, we're definitely going to take up footnote M uh, next week. What's, what do you see the action item here, uh, Chris, for, for this item, the, the ADU item? I don't think um, there is an action item. I think people need to have a chance to look at the material that's been posted and sent to them and then maybe next week they'll be ready to um, decide if, if that's what they want to go forward with. Okay, good. So I'm also, you know, so we're, we're like uh, three hours into this and the, and the next one, the BL um, is a big one. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, we could, you know, take a, a poll here. Do people want to gut out, you know, more complicated item uh, you know, at this time at night. <laughs> um, and so that, that that's just my opinion. I, I'll forge forward, but I, I, I feel like the, there's been a lot of, a uh, lot of heavy lifting here by everyone. And I just want to make sure that it, you know, it doesn't fall on deaf ears if we're doing this presentation, uh, given, um, you know, it's 9.30. So I'm just going to do a quick straw poll. Um, does that sound reasonable to you, Chris? My recommendation would be to um, ask Nate's forbearance and put this off till next Wednesday if Nate is available to present it. And I think we'll all be, um, you know, much more bright-eyed and ready to accept the new ideas. Okay, Nate, what do you say? Uh, Sure. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll even update the presentation a little bit then. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, you know, again, I, I, I know we have a lot, uh, but I just... Um... So, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I think the slides were at least emailed to the board and, you know, um, like with the ADU, if there's comments, you know, board members have comments individually, you can also send them to staff and, you know, that could help, you know, refine the presentation. Okay. Well, I know they weren't in our package. I know I'm, I'm right. they're, they're in my email. I'm sure if you say so, uh, I'm, I'm behind I think on so. those. I don't know <laughs> um, any, here, let me get, anybody want to put a hand up on the board with regard to uh, moving forward with the, with the next item, which is dealing with the BL? Uh, Janet? Um, I would love to start next week with the BL. I'm, I'm tired. Yeah, good. Uh, and Maria? I wonder if we could just do two topics per meeting. So, you know, three was a bit of a stretch, I think. So maybe next week, start with BL and then choose one of the other two. Well, um, yeah, I guess, uh, th you know, uh, we can always do what we're going to do tonight, it looks like. Uh, Andrew? 
yeah, I would like to postpone it. I think actually, Maria, that's a pretty good suggestion just to help keep us focused. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would support that. Okay. All right. With that, uh, let's put um, the BL and we can kind of discuss what's in order because I feel like we're close on them. Um, it'd be nice to kind of, and I know BL was the first one that, that the zoning subcommittee took on. So, you know, maybe we can talk Chris and, and work out what, what order uh, we, you know, want to do and kind of get some feedback on that. But uh, we'll, we'll be meeting uh, next, next Wednesday uh, on these zoning priorities. So with that, um, we can uh, skip to old business. You no old business, no new business, and you don't have to do any reports. And we have a form A that's coming in, but it's not here yet. And yeah, you. CBA. As far as uh, new things that are coming in, I know that the North Amherst Library is probably coming in tomorrow. So that's something for you to look forward to for mid March. And there are other things out, out there in the wings. Sure. Okay. Uh, and then you put in the packet, the, there's a little summary from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. I did, uh, yep. On the highlights. So. Um, and I want to apologize to Doug for not having answered his questions. I think I did forward them to the planning board members. Did I not? Oh, I forwarded them to Ben. Mm -hmm. And I expected him to answer them in his presentation. <laughs> so we'll look back at those questions, Doug. Sorry. And another good reason to uh, to push this to next week is, is Tom uh, never oh, Tom Long. was able to make it. Um, yeah. He gave us warning that he's he was dealing with a personal issue. So um, with that, I mean, report to the chair, I have nothing. I want to thank my wonderful planning staff for all the work they've been doing in the last few mm -hmm. weeks. It's really impressive. Thank you. It sure is. All right. I think we can adjourn. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night.